is how we can enhance our city safety net program and, uh, and also uh, especially the hunger programs in New York City. So it, it is um, a manifest uh, priority of this speaker and we look forward to all the great work that he's going to be doing on behalf of the council to advance those objectives. And with that, I will turn it over to Speaker Corey Johnson. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Councilmember Corey Johnson, Speaker of the New York City Council. And first, I want to thank my dear, dear, dear friend, uh, Councilmember Steve Levin, for his uh, Grenenchik, one day you will get three dear, dear, dears. You're not, you have to be quiet for you to get those three that's dear, dear. Gonna that's never going to So you're never going to get three dears. Uh, uh, Councilmember Steve Levin for his dedication to this topic uh, over the course of the last four years as chair of the General Welfare Committee. And it is my honor to appoint uh, Councilmember Levin as chair of this committee for another four years. He has been an incredible voice for uh, vulnerable children, for homeless New Yorkers, for people who rely on our social service programs and our robust social safety net here in New York City. And I'm very, very proud of him. I also want to thank the incredible committee staff uh, for their great work over the last four years. They've done a great, great job. And I'm really um, grateful for all that they do for this council and to uh, really uh, bring these issues to light for New Yorkers. Uh, lastly, I want to thank the advocacy and provider community uh, for being here today. Uh, your efforts, along with partners in city government, provide vulnerable New Yorkers with their most basic needs. Uh, today we're holding a hearing, as Chair Levin said, on efforts to reduce hunger in New York City. There are far too many people who don't know where their next meal will come from. The meal gap for New York City, the city's official measure of food insecurity, is nearly uh, 225 million meals. That is, New York City residents who experience food insecurity fall short of an adequate diet by 225 meals in a single year. Approximately 339,000 New York City children, or approximately one out of every five, 19%, rely on soup kitchens and pantries. And approximately 204,000 New York City seniors, or approximately one out of every five, again, 20% of seniors, rely on soup kitchens or pantries. Anti-hunger initiatives are a core component of the social safety net. An estimated 1.4 million New York City residents rely on emergency food programs, including soup kitchens and food pantries each year. The busiest soup kitchen, I believe, in the city of New York and I think on the east coast of the United States is uh, proudly in my district, Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen. They are the best. Uh, and there are many other soup kitchens that do similar work, and I'm proud of them as well. One point, in New York City, 1.64 million people rely on SNAP benefits to meet their most basic nutritional needs. While SNAP is crucial in our fight against hunger, families often cannot stretch their benefits to the end of the month and must turn to our city's network of nearly 1,000 food pantries and soup kitchens to fill the gap. The Trump administration wants to make devastating cuts to SNAP and potentially institute one of the biggest shakeups in this life-saving program's five-decade history. And the Trump tax bill provides benefits to those at the very top at the expense of the most vulnerable. We saw some of the hits that HUD is supposed to take in the budget that was released yesterday and other anti-poverty initiatives. The federal government should be a partner in finding solutions to homelessness and the hunger crisis, not be a partner that is exacerbating a crisis and making it worse. The New York City Council is committed to fighting hunger in a variety of ways, securing three straight years of funding increases to EFAP, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and Councilmember Levin, uh, Chair Levin, and Councilmember Grudenchik deserve an enormous amount of credit for their leadership uh, in that fight, uh, supporting school pantries, uh, funding SNAP enrollment, and directing dollars to support food purchases and operations at food pantries and soup kitchens across the city. We as a council continue to be committed to reducing food insecurity and fighting against hunger, poverty, and undernutrition in New York City. And I hope this hearing is the beginning of a conversation on how we can all work together to ensure and expand access to food, healthy food, to every single individual in New York City. I would like to thank again Chair Levin and the advocates and the providers once again for their work on this important topic. I'm very happy to see my friend Barbara Turk, who I think has done a fantastic job the past four years in working with providers in the community 
and thinking about ways to get healthier food and supporting community gardens and doing all this important work. I was really proud to work with her when I was chair of the health committee and I'm grateful that she continues in this position. She's been a really wonderful partner to work with and all of you, I wanna thank you as well. I, I just wanna uh, finish uh, by saying that the numbers are really you know, devastating across the board and I think they're really hard actually for the vast majority of New Yorkers to comprehend. When I gave a speech at you know, ABNY uh, two weeks ago, the Association for a Better New York, I mentioned, and I think folks in that room were pretty floored by it, that 22% of New Yorkers are living below the poverty line. That's 1.7 million people. When you walk down the streets of New York City, one in every five people are living in poverty. And then when we look at the meal gap, as we just talked about, um, that affects many people who aren't even considered to be living in poverty, but don't know where the next meal is coming from. With the homeless crisis that the city's facing, 61,000 people in the shelter system last night, that's just a DHS shelter, doesn't, come out, doesn't count HRA domestic violence shelters or DYCD youth shelters. We're close to 70,000 people who are in shelter, and then almost 5,000 unsheltered New Yorkers who are living on the streets of New York City. And so in the wealthiest city uh, in the world, with uh, many industries that could be partnering with city government and with the incredible, non I see Joel Berg here, with the incredible nonprofit organizations that do this work day in and day out, uh, we have to do better. We have to reduce hunger and poverty has remained very steady in New York City since the 1980s. It's been stuck at around 20%. So my hope is to of course look at the very important work that you all are doing, understand the funding gaps that we're potentially gonna see now with federal cuts to SNAP and to other social safety net programs that support the most vulnerable, and to figure out how we, in a fulsome way, figure out uh, how we reduce that number, how we get that stubborn 20% number down, and we get more people fed, we lift people out of poverty, and I know that hunger doesn't exist in a vacuum. It has to do with housing costs and healthcare costs and education and a variety of factors that play into this uh, very, very important issue. I don't raise this issue uh, because it's like mom and apple pie. You know, it's easy to talk about hunger. I raise this issue because uh, I live not too far from Holy Apostle Soup Kitchen. And when I walk by, uh, every single day or the days that I do walk by there, when you see the lines, people lining up three hours before the soup kitchen opens up, when you see people stretch down two blocks, when you see <clears throat> people going to get food for their children to bring home or putting an extra meal aside to stay, to stay uh, fed, um, this is not academic. The providers in this room know this, that it's not academic. They know the number of people that they serve. They know the human toll and impact that this has on people's lives. And so I really want to uh, learn from you all, uh, from the administration who is doing this very important work, and from the providers who probably know of better ways that we could be doing this work and the way that the council and city government can step up in a variety of ways, whether it's through our land use processes for getting more uh, grocery stores that are affordable in neighborhoods through yeah. land use, through legislation on how we tackle this issue, through oversight and figuring out where city dollars could be better spent, and through the budget process to increase EFAP to the amount of money that it needs to be uh, on what the actual need is. So. The members of this committee, uh, Councilmember Lander, Councilmember Joni, uh, Councilmember Adams, Councilmember Grudenchik, Councilmember Rayala, and the chair are all people who are deeply committed to this issue, I know, and I know you all are as well. This is gonna be an issue that I am going to focus on uh, with a laser over the next four years because I want that number to come down, the meal gap number, the poverty number, and anything that this council needs to do to advocate to make that happen. You have my deep and unabiding commitment. So again, I wanna thank you. I look forward to your testimony, and I wanna thank Chair Levin for having me here today, and I apologize for being late. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Councilmember Brad Landry, who has returned as a member of the General Welfare Committee after a four-year hiatus. Very, very happy to be back. Thanks, Brad. Um, <clears throat> and 
with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pick up uh, the rest of my remarks. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, so according to the latest USDA data, and the speaker spoke to uh, a lot of this, an estimated, an estimated 1.25 million New Yorkers, or nearly 15%, were food insecure in 2015, compared to, uh, compared to 1.37 million New Yorkers, or 16%, the previous year. Um, despite this decrease, New York City's food insecurity rate is 11% higher than the national rate and 18% higher than the statewide rate. Furthermore, according to Feeding America, the nation's leading hunger relief organization, New Yorkers missed approximately 224.8 million meals in 2015, which is also known as the meal gap, as the speaker said. This is a, ne a decrease from 242 million previous year uh, but SNAP uh, and, and SNAP participation in New York City has also declined uh, from 1.7 million to 1.64 million New Yorkers who receive SNAP benefits. Despite these downward trends, we cannot ignore the fact that food insecurity remains a very serious problem in our city. When examining food insecurity, the final stopgap of our social safety net is the over 1,000 food pantries and soup kitchens across the five boroughs. And I just want to take a second to acknowledge the great work that they do because uh, a lot of these programs are volunteer-based or they may have one or two staff people. They are uh, scraping by. They are doing whatever they can to get good, quality, nutritious food uh, to their neighbors. And that, that includes um, partnering with other community organizations, partnering with faith-based faith -based institutions, um, working with City Harvest and the Food Bank, and also raising funds themselves, raising private funds uh, that, are, that are flexible so that they can uh, maybe hire part-time staff um, or do transportation. Um, you know, despite all of our efforts, a lot of our pantries and soup kitchens go above and beyond what the city is doing for them to ensure that food gets to the hungry people that they serve. Back to the prepared remarks. According to the Food Bank, 1.4 million New Yorkers rely on pantries and soup kitchens to meet their basic nutrition needs. And since the 2008 recession, food pantries and soup kitchens have seen an increased demand for their services every single day. This means that for the past 10 years, uh, more and more New Yorkers sought emergency food assistance because of their SNAP benefits because their SNAP benefits were not sufficient enough. As a result, pantries consistently report having insufficient supplies to fill pantry bags and having to turn people away when food runs out. In addition to the current need, we are facing the possibility of the federal government putting existing SNAP benefits at risk. We will do all that we can to avoid this from becoming a reality, but if the federal government succeeds in cutting SNAP benefits, the city must be prepared to fill in the gaps that may be left behind. And just one note about the, uh, the, the President's budget plan as it relates to SNAP. Uh, that is a grotesque uh, proposal. Um, we must do everything we can uh, to call it out for it, what it is, which is a dismantling of the SNAP program as it's been built up over the previous decades. And we, we need, need to do absolutely everything we can to work with our members of Congress uh, to, to uh, fight that becoming a reality. Um, I would like to acknowledge this administration's efforts to increase food access across the city through various programs, including Access NYC, where applicants can apply for SNAP online, outreach campaigns to NYCHA residents and seniors, and the Food Assistance Collaborative aimed to build and expand the capacity of food pantries. However, more must be done to ensure that no New Yorker goes hungry. And to that end, I'd be remiss if I did not mention that in the mayor's preliminary budget, Again, we saw um, not a baseline of the, of the full allocation to EFAF that we saw in the adopted budget last year. That's very disappointing, very disappointing. Um, we, this is too important of an issue, too vital of an issue for New York City to make it a, um, you know, the last remaining vestige of the budget dance, really. Um, you know, back uh, during the Bloomberg administration, we had uh, dozens of issues that wouldn't make it into the executive budget or the preliminary budget, and then and then get put in by the council or through negotiations by the administration at adoption. Um, this is the last one uh, that we still do that with, and it's, it's unacceptable. We need to baseline this, this funding. Uh, we need to make sure that it's there year after year. Uh, we do not want to have to have a budget dance over hungry New Yorkers every single year. Um, I would like to thank the council staff for their work in preparing for today's hearing, policy analyst Tanya Cyrus, the Mirror News Hot, our finance analyst, our finance, finance unit head, Dohini Sampura, 
And I'd also like to especially acknowledge and welcome our new counsel to the committee, Aminta Kilowan. Yay. Um, and our legal fellow, Rab Rabia Kwasim. Welcome, Rabia. Um, lastly, I'd like to thank my chief of staff, Jonathan Boucher, and communications and budget director, Edward Paulino. I'd also like to welcome uh, Councilmember Vanessa Gibson of the Bronx, a uh, member of the committee. And now I would like to swear in the representatives from the administration before giving your testimony. If you can raise your right hand, please. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Thank you. Okay. You may begin. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairman Levin and members of the City Council's General Welfare Committee for inviting us to testify and respond to committee questions today. My name is Grace Bonilla, and I am the administrator of the New York City Human Resources Administration. Before beginning my testimony, I would like to take a moment to welcome the new members of the council, as well as those members new to this committee. I look forward to our partnership as we work together to improve the lives of low-income and vulnerable New Yorkers, and uh, thank you, Speaker Johnson, for being with us today. This committee's annual hunger hearing is a welcome opportunity to discuss many of the initiatives and programs that this administration has undertaken to address hunger, food insecurity, and access to nutritious food. HRA plays a pivotal role in minimizing hunger and ensuring that food assistance remains a vital, ready, readily available support for low-income individuals and families. However, our work is not done in isolation, and today I'm joined by Barbara Turk from the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, as well as my HRA colleagues, Lisa Fitzpatrick, Chief Program Officer, and Marie Phillip, Deputy Commissioner for Emergency Intervention Services. It is an unfortunate truth that we live in the time, at a time of declining wages coupled with the rising cost of rent, food, transportation, and other commodities with con which contribute to food insecurity and hunger. These factors are exacerbated by under and, and unemployment, which culminate in persistent income inequality. Food insecurity isn't only about hunger. Hunger impacts health, including a high prevalence of re uh, preventable illnesses, and as it is so often the case, our youngest and oldest neighbors are the most vulnerable when it comes to food insecurity. Their negative impacts on school attendance, academic outcomes, and behavior challenges for children, and seniors who are unable to meet their nutritional needs face an accelerated deterioration in health and quality of life from conditions such as cardiovascular disease, stroke, and increased slip and falls. At HRA, we provide essential programs and supports to low-income New Yorkers that reduce hunger and decrease the threat of food insecurity, but also work to eliminate the root causes. Every day, in all five boroughs, HRA works to ensure that our services and benefits provide low-income New Yorkers the assistance they need through a wide range of supports, including cash assistance and employment services, Employment Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP or food stamps, eviction prevention, and rental assistance, to name a few. However, despite our efforts as we testify each year, hunger, food insecurity, and lack of access to nutritional food options continue to be a serious problem in New York City. The reality remains too many of our fellow New Yorkers find themselves in the position of having to choose between paying for vital expenses such as rent or purchasing nutritious food. These food insecure households routinely report the food they buy does not last long enough or they cannot afford a balanced diet or are forced to skip meals or eat less despite still feeling hungry. According to the latest available data, 1.25 million New Yorkers or 14% of New York population were food insecure at some point during 2015. And while this shows a decline from the year before, there's still far too many New Yorkers who don't know where their next meal will come from. Thanks to the launch of the Poverty Tracker in 2012, an initiative of Robin Hood, in partnership with Columbia University's Population Research Center, data was collected across five boroughs through quarterly surveys of 6,000 city residents over the past two years. This allowed for the collection of telling information from a representative sample of New York City residents. From this data we've learned, roughly 16% of New York City households experience persistent ongoing food hardship. Race predicts higher food insecurity regardless of income and other factors. Food insecurity is significantly higher for non-white populations. Food hardship is tied to poverty and to other material hardships like trouble paying bills or housing hardships. 
Having children and being a single parent household are each separately significant drivers of food insecurity and being a female head of household increases the chances of food insecurity. Having lower levels of education is tied to higher rates of food hardship. In an effort to address the devastating effects of food insecurity, increasing access to and retaining benefits have been a cornerstone of HRA's mandate as part of the de Blasio administration. Our goal over the previous four years has been to be, make it easier for those New Yorkers seeking benefits for which they're eligible to both gain access to them and avoid losing them as a result of bureaucratic red tape. SNAP or food stamps is the nation's most important anti-hunger program. The program assists more than 45 million low-income Americans, 70% of whom are families with children, and more than one in four are households with seniors or individuals with disability. Currently, nearly 1.64 million New Yorkers receive SNAP, including 569,000 children and approximately 424 senior, 424,000 seniors. Of these nearly 1.64 million New Yorkers, 398,749 of them also receive cash assistance, an important safety net for children and adults. Many SNAP recipients are employed but their incomes are so low that they still qualify for benefits. And in addition to the direct support SNAP provides families and individuals, it, is al it also injects approximately $5.4 billion into the local economy, with most of these transactions occurring at small businesses across the city. But hunger is not only about food. Between 2000 and 2014, the medium New York City household income increased by just 4.8% in real dollars, while the medium rent increased by 18.3% in real dollars. Meanwhile, between 1994 and 2012, the city suffered a net loss of about 150,000 rent-stabilized units. Combined, these and other trends meant that a by 2015, the city had only half the housing it needs for about 3 million low-income New Yorkers. As such, New Yorkers sacrifice a great deal to stay in their homes and maintain their connections to their communities. Some 360,000 New York City households pay more than 50% of their income on rent and utilities. Another 140,000 households pay more than 30%. This means a total of half a million New, Yorker city, New York City households are paying an unaffordable amount of their income for housing. Additionally, according to a report by the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, nearly 60% of New Yorkers do not have enough savings to cover a minimum of three months' worth of household expenses, which in stark terms means these households are a missed paycheck away from the threat of housing instability, including eviction and homelessness. To address these drivers of hunger, HRA has expanded rental assistance and emergency grants, and in partnership with the Council has implemented the nation's first Universal Access to Council program, an unprecedented investment in legal services to help New Yorkers stay in their homes. Last month, we announced residential evictions by marshals had declined by 27 percent since 2013, thanks to putting these preventive programs in place. During this time, there were also two consecutive years of Rent Guideline Board rent freezes. All of this is part of a broader effort to address income inequality and food insecurity. Because when we are able to intervene to keep families and individuals stably housed, we're also addressing hunger. We also know that higher wages, wage jobs, and access to training and educational opportunities, opportunities greatly improve food security and can prevent homelessness by helping families and individuals to achieve financial and household stability. As we have reported previously, in April 2017, HRA, HRA expanded and improved its employment services by implementing new programs that emphasized helping clients to proceed on a career pathway and off public assistance caseload. Evidence-based research supports these approaches. When clients are able to secure living wage jobs and move up the career ladder, families are more likely to be able to secure the resources and the means to avoid homelessness and permanently move off the caseload and out of poverty. 
and to address the root causes of and close the gap created by income inequality, this administration has been laser focused on additional anti-poverty initiatives. We would be remiss not to highlight among them pre-K for all, increase affordable housing development, and raising the minimum wage. This administration has also expanded paid sick leave and resolved, ex res resolved expired municipal labor contracts. Each of these investments is essential to lifting New Yorkers out of poverty and thereby minimizing the risk of its collateral consequences, hunger, poor health, and homelessness. HRA reforming the client experience. Throughout the administration's first term, HRA reformed, streamlined, and eliminated bureaucratic and linguistic barriers to enrollment and recertification, not only for SNAP, but also for other programs and vital services administered by the agency. However, addressing access is only one part of the equation. We are also addressing stigma with respect to asking for and receiving help, whether real or perceived, through our outreach and advocacy. HRA, in, the, in partnership with CBLs across the city, continues to conduct outreach to SNAP eligible families and individuals with a focus on vulnerable populations that are particularly susceptible to food insecurity and to ensure that clients who are receiving our benefits continue to get the support they need, we have implemented a number of reforms aimed at enhancing the client experience. We've implemented a series of reforms to provide reasonable accommodations for clients with disabilities to improve access to benefits. We have conducted agency-wide lesbian, gay, bisexual, transge transgender questioning and intersect cultural competency training in addition to our long-standing customer service training. And HRA has tra trained over 7,000 public-facing staff on full-day training entitled Introduction to Disabilities, an Overview of Disability Awareness, Etiquette, and Culture. And in 2017, HRA used telephonic interpretation services an average of 1,000 times per day. In total, HRA spent $3.6 million on la language services in 2017. We have also implemented through various waivers a range of technology initiatives that have resulted in reducing wait time, decreased visits to our centers, and immediate access to case information. I will now spend a few minutes uh, discussing the benefits of reengineering, technology improvements, and other efforts that impact our clients' experience. Continued improvement to enroll and, and stay on SNAP. The goal of our reforms is to remove real barriers to access by creating a self-directed service model that allows applicants and clients to transact with the agency without the burden of having to physically come into the, to an HRA location. Launching Access HRA. Access HRA is an innovative internet-based tool that allows New York City residents to in, retrieve benefit information and or apply and recertify for SNAP and other benefits. This portal allows clients to create an Access HRA account to gain access to over 100 case-specific points of information in real time, including application and case statuses, upcoming appointments, account balance, and documents requested for eligibility determination. Additionally, clients can make changes to contact information, view eligibility notice, it, notice electronically, and opt into text messages and email alerts. We continue to improve this tool to add new functionality, and now clients can submit their SNAP periodic report online using Access HRA. This new feature allows clients to report changes in household composition, income, and other circumstances. As of December 2017, there were more than 1 million Access HRA online accounts for SNAP households, and we received over 24,000 online applications and 2,500 periodic reports each month. The change to online transaction has transformed the way HRA interacts with our clients. Because clients can do so many things from a PC outside of the center and can easily call us for their interviews, SNAP in the center foot traffic has declined 32% since 2014. Fortifying our partnership with community-based organizations. The Access HRA Provider Portal is an online tool designed specifically for community-based organizations to connect with the clients that they serve. Through the Access HRA Provider Portal, organizations can view real-time benefit information for their clients. Since the launch of the Provider Portal tool in September of last year, 185 organizations has, have signed up to utilize this tool. 
implementing on-demand interviews allows clients to conduct their SNAP eligibility interviews on an on-demand basis at their convenience, rather than wait for a call during a four-hour window under an old system, or come into a center and wait for an in-person interview. The clearest success indicator for on-demand has been the channel shift of interviews taking place in person at centers to interviews being held over the phone at the client's convenience. In October 2015, before the implementation of the on-demand call center, only 52% of the completed SNAP recertification interviews were completed via telephone. We now have 76% of the interviews held by phone, a 24% increase. On-demand interviews for SNAP recertification have been fully in place for more than a year. On-demand interviews for new SNAP applications began to be phased in during the fall of 2017. Roll out, rolled out the HRA mobile app, a self-service mobile app to give clients the ability to use their mobile device to better manage their cases. Since the application's launch, clients have downloaded the mobile app 118,000 times and uploaded over 2 million images. Providing on-site self-service. For clients who prefer to access our services inside one of our centers, we have a, a suite of self-service tools. These tools include self-service check-in kiosks, the PC banks to utilize Access HRA, and the self-service scanning. There are currently 15, 15 SNAP centers and 185 community-based organizations across the city where clients can quickly and easily scan and submit documents electronically in addition 12 job centers have scanners and 12 job centers have self-service kiosks. I would like to pause now to provide a demo on Access HRA and the Provital Portal. For the record, I'm very excited to see this. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. So as mentioned by Administrator uh, Bonilia. I'm sorry, if you can uh, identify yourself for the record, please. My name is Sabrina Simmons. Thank you. Okay, I'm sorry. Technical difficulties sorry. couldn't get it together. Yes. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sabrina Simmons, and I'm with the Office of Advocacy and Outreach under the HRA administration. As mentioned by our administrator, I'll be providing a demo on the Access HRA website. So the Access HRA website is a user-friendly website that allows clients the ability to apply for SNAP benefits. Clients can recertify for SNAP and cash benefits, um, as well as as of November of last year, also submit their SNAP periodic report. Uh, clients can check the status of their current case status as well as see the available information in the seven languages that are available across our city. This is our Access HRA home screen and on this screen you can see we have our apply now button and that allows our clients to apply for the benefits that they would like to apply for. Under the view my cases <coughs> section clients are able to see case details, and I'll show that on another screen. However, once clients, once clients have created their account, they're able to go into the home screen and see draft applications that they previously submitted or need to submit to HRA. They can see documents that they need to submit to HRA in order to keep their cases open. Clients are also able to continue an application, so if they start an application at home, and are having difficulty um, completing that application, they can go into either an HRA center or any community-based organization um, to have that application continue under drafts. Under this section, as I previously showed in the view my cases section, this is just a case details. And what that shows is just different areas on a, on a client's case. Clients are able to see EBT balances as far as case details, they can track payments that are made on behalf of their EBT cards. Clients can see upcoming appointments, if they have upcoming re recertifications, if they are able to, under my benefits, they can see documents that they need to submit, whether or not they've kept their interviews, and also if they have any kind of shelter payments <coughs> on behalf of the client, they can see when the landlord has received the check, cashed the check, um, 
all that information is available. So as mentioned by our administrator, we also have our Access HRA provider portal um, tool, and it's also, it's a complement to our Access HRA website. On the provider portal, providers are able to see basically a caseload of clients that have granted access to that organization. They can see upcoming appointments, recertifications that are due, as well as documents that they need to submit, um, and also be able to read notices um, on behalf of the clients, which we found to be very which we found to allow providers to be proactive instead of reactive when um, providing any kind of case assistance. That's, that's all that I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank you. Okay. Uh, each of these singular technological improvements represents a reduction or elimination of, of a significant barrier. Together, they represent a comprehensive change to the way in which clients apply for and recertify for benefits, ultimately reducing the number of clients who do not receive these vital SNAP benefits because it is too hard to apply and recertify, or the investment of their time is too great. By mitigating the barriers to access, we can ensure clients maintain their benefits and reduce the churn of clients at recertification, i.e. reapplication within a short period of time after case closure, which is the national problem. Now I would like to discuss other initiatives and reforms that are helping to reduce hunger and tackle poverty in New York City. New York City SNAP participation rate. Economic improvement generally correlates to a SNAP participation rate reduction. Not surprisingly, as the local economy continues to improve, the SNAP participation rate in New York City declines. And it declined from 77% in 2013 to 72% in 2016. In line with our prior testi testimony, we believe HRA SNAP participation rates should not be compared to the state and national participation rates released by USDA, which this committee is familiar with. The best metric for comparison across geographic areas is the Program Access Index, calculated by dividing the SNAP caseload by the number of people below 125% of the federal poverty line. Based on the PAI metric, SNAP coverage is higher in New York City than it is in the, in the country and the rest of New York State. Specifically, the New York City PAI is 84% for 2016 compared to 75% in the U.S. and 82% in New York State overall. As I just summarized, under the administration, we have taken significant steps to ensure that all eligible New Yorkers have unencumbered access to HRA benefits and services. And recent data show positive trends that we are pleased to report that application rejections are down and successful case recertifications are up. HRA's Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program Support Services seeks to educate the public about SNAP benefits and eligibility, eligibility guidelines. In addition, this unit pre-screens clients to determine eligibility and assist applicants with the application process. In uh, fiscal year 17, HRA SNAP Support Services provided services at 1,841 individual events at 373 individual community site locations and provided services at 175 sites on a recurrent basis. These are, site, these are sites where services are consistently scheduled at various frequencies throughout the year. HRA also partners with 150 community, 54 community-based organizations to provide SNAP outreach throughout New York City. Among its many responsibilities, this group is charged with ensuring that elig eligible immigrants and or qualified family members are enrolled in the SNAP program and receive SNAP benefits. This administration has significantly expanded our outreach services to immigrants as well as New Yorkers with low literacy and limited English proficiency by per partnering with over 100 community-based human services and government agency organizations with proven track records of providing services to these groups. Our most significant outreach effort is the SNAP Helps campaign that utilizes a special website called foodhelp.nyc. Since the inception of the SNAP Helps campaign in April 2015, Food Help NYC has seen approximately 230,500 lifetime users with roughly 85% being new users. The SNAP Helps campaign encourages New Yorkers to struggling to afford food to seek help target low-income seniors and immigrants. Additionally, there were approximately 71,000 click-throughs from Food Help to NYC to access NYC. 
Emergency Food Assistance Program. An FY18 HRA's Emergency Food Assistance Program total funding for food and administrative expenses is $18.7 million and includes a baseline of $11.5 million, with $7.2 million in funding added by the administration at the time of adoption for FY18. The total EFAT budget in FY18 is $19.5 million, including the $800,000 included by the, city, by the council. This funding is being used to provide additional food and increase for warehouse and transportation to build the capacity of the food distribution system to distribute more food to New Yorkers in need. Food distribution to those in need remains our most important objective. In FY17, EFAP distributed more than 12.7 million pounds of food, included, including over 632,000 pounds of frozen food. In the same period, EFAP programs reported serving more than 14.8 million people. This is a self-reported duplica uh, duplicated statistic. The actual purchase of these items is based on the analysis of the needs and trends of the emergency food network. EFAP provides over 40 food items and purchases the most nutritious food items that also meet the dietary and cooking needs of special populations such as homeless New Yorkers, those with HIV AIDS, and those that need kosher or a halal diet. Overall, these items tend to cost more. In addition, many of these food items are packaged differently, which increases the cost. More expensive and, light, and lighter packages, packaged food can also result in fewer pounds distributed. While working to ensure that New Yorkers have a hot, healthy meal, we are also working to reduce the prevalence of obesity, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease. Since 2008, EFAP has required all food purchased with city funding to be compliant with the New York City food standards requirements and meet nutritional standards including but not limited to standards for sodium, sugar, and trans fat. In addition, HRA requires that all 528 emergency food programs funded by EFAP provide SNAP outreach services. These services include SNAP eligibility screening, assistance with the SNAP application process, and guidance on making healthy food choices. As in previous testimonies, the administration continues to recognize the work of the New York City Food Assistance Collaborative, which formed in 2015 with an investment from the Helmsley Charitable Trust. In 2015, and the Director of Food Policy in the Mayor's Office, HRA New York State uh, HPNAP and Key NYC Emergency Food Distributors formed the New York City Food Assistance Collaborative. The collaborative came together to further the goal of enhanced coordination among emergency food suppliers and bringing new resources to support the important work of over 900 community-based food providers. The collaborative's work is focused on building capacity and increasing the food supply in the city's most underserved neighborhoods by establishing a common metric, the supply gap, an, informa an information sharing system to better match supply with need. The collaborative was able to identify priority neighborhoods for additional investment, increase food supply from public to private resources, strengthen the pantry capacity to distribute safe, nutritious food, including starting new pantries where there were none, upgrading storage, especially for fresh food, and adding more distribution hours and using alternative distribution methods, mobile vehicles, for hard to reach areas. The collaborative also leveraged a t technology to enhance pantries' ability to better serve clients. This included enhanced feednyc.org to share crucial information, like detailed information about food supply, building an app called Plentiful, a simple mobile technology that en enables better customer service at pantries. Plentiful allows pantry clients to reserve their place in line and allows pantries to understand it and serve their service statistics. Pantries have loved Plentiful, and we see rapid adoption. We have 100 registered pantries and over 32,000 households served already. The Food Assistance Collaborative set a goal to distribute 10 million more pounds of food in its pro uh, priority communities. The Helmsley Charitable Trust investment of $9.8 million funds infrastructure and improvements and supports to 
current and new pantries. Their investment also includes the development of new shared data and mobile app system. In order to supply food to meet this new capacity, this year's adopted budget included an increase of $7.2 million and $800,000 from the council, which provided additional food and other resources to pantries. An additional support of $4.5 million from City Harvest and United Way have helped us achieve that goal. As you know, the preliminary budget was released while the federal budget was still being negotiated, and the current federal, conti uh, federal continuing resolutions re runs until March 23, 2018, and before the conclusion of the state budget agreement that is due on April 1st. Prior to the release of the executive budget, we will evaluate the impact of the federal and state budgets as well as the results of the NYC Food Assistance Collaborative Initiative, and I'm sure we will be working collaboratively as we approach the executive budget. ABOD. In May 2014, New York City accepted the state's ABOD waiver, which allowed able-bodied adults, also known as able-bodied adults with, with, without dependents, who are not meeting the work requirements <coughs> to receive SNAP when they could not find at least 80 hours of work per month. Such waivers are permitted for areas with high unemployment, and as such, New York State has been covered due to the effects of the Great Recession of 2008. However, the improved economy since then means some areas no longer qualify for a waiver. At the 2017 hunger hearing, we reported that the borough of Manhattan below West 110th Street and below East 96th Street was only part of the city's impacted ABOD requirements because the federal government determined that it did not meet the federal standard for a waiver. At last year's at last year, we provided an update to the council at the preliminary budget hearing that Queens, with the exception of Community District 12, was no longer eligible for the ABOD waiver due to improved economic conditions. Given this change for New York City, HRA proactively reached out to all ABODs to alert them of this important change and the impact on their benefits. HRA sent multiple letters and conducted robocalls instructing clients to report that they met or were exempt from the work requirements or how we could provide employment services to maintain their SNAP benefits. As a result, 1,312 came into HRA employment providers to report changes to their status or to conduct, connect with employment services to meet the ABOT work requirement. 609 clients reported a change in status and 508 met the work requirements through work, and work with employment providers or through their own employment. 2,800 lost their benefit after not meeting the federal ABOD requirements. I will now discuss efforts from our partners at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and their work to contribute to the administration's efforts to address food insecurity and hunger. Partnering with DOHMH. In an effort to help clients close the gap in their food budget, DOHMA distributes Health Bucks coupons, which can be used to purchase fresh fruits and vegetables at all NYC farmers markets. Health Bucks represents a 40% increase for the customer purchasing power. This benefits SNAP recipients, enabling them to buy high quality nutritious pro produce and allowing them to support regional and local farms, which is an important link as Congress continues to try to decouple SNAP from the Farm Bill. In 2017, more than 500,000 health bucks were distributed at farmers markets through the SNAP incentive and by community based organizations as part of the nutrition and health programming and by elected officials and organizations that purchase health bucks to hand out through their programs. New York City DOHMH recently expanded this in, in innovative program from five month se season to a 12 month program so that SNAP participants can stretch their purchasing power year round. The result is e exciting and we are pleased to report customers spent what $1,100,278 in SNAP benefits at Grow, Grow NYC Farmers Markets in 2018. We continue to report that EBT cards are now accepted at more than 125 farmers markets across the city. Outreach to older New Yorkers. Since 2014, HRA has employed Benefits Data Trust's proven model of targeting outreach and application assistance, using enrollment data for the five boroughs and working with HRA to com complement our own outreach. The New York City Benefits Center uh, implemented a phone and direct mail campaign for seniors who are not receiving SNAP. 
When seniors respond to this targeted outreach, highly trained staff from the New York Benefits Center guide them through the process from beginning to end, offering application assistance, document support, and follow-up services. In 2017, BDT began conducting outreach to seniors for whom it submitted the original application to assist with recertification and leverage the automated interactive voice response system process that many seniors are eligible for. Last year, the Robin Hood Foundation and City enrolled, rolled out a joint campaign to increase participation in targeted benefit programs including SNAP, Women's Infant and Children, WIC, and other earned income tax credit, all proven anti-poverty programs. This campaign includes a mass media campaign which ran in spring 2017 and community-based outreach and service delivery for potentially eligible individuals. A major component of the, this two-year campaign is an expansion of the collaborative and targeted outreach among HRA, BDT, and the Robin Hood Foundation with the launch of two new SNAP initiatives informed by behavioral economics. The guardrail strategy sends data-driven robotax and robodials reminding clients to complete the necessary steps of the SNAP application and recertification process and offers phone assistance to those that need it most. The Medicaid SNAP Connection pilot launched in November 2017 works to connect Medicaid recipients of all ages to SNAP. Preventing hunger in schools. We know that it, it is difficult for students to thrive on empty stomachs, which is why this administration has been focused on ensuring that every student is provided with high quality and nutritious food for breakfast, lunch, and in many cases, dinner. The following initiatives are helping to ensure that most vulnerable New Yorkers, are, or our children, are able to have nutritious meal regardless of the time of day or year. To accomplish this, we launch a free school lunch for all beginning this year. We launched breakfast in the classroom in all elementary school in FY18, made summer meals available for all, are procuring local fresh and sustainable pr produce school food, spent $26 million on regional food in FY17, piloted Meatless Monday in 15 Brooklyn public schools, launched New York Thursdays to, local, to lo a locally sourced menu in partnership with New York State's Agriculture and Markets, and were awarded a Farm to School grant for our Garden to Cafe program, which supports the use of edible school gardens in a cafeteria and in classrooms. SNAP and Emergency Food Assistance Program, as well as other initiatives detailed in this testimony, will continue to provide necessary nutrition assistance to New Yorkers in need, but more rem remains to be done to ensure that no New Yorker wakes up or goes to sleep hungry as a result of an inability to afford and purchase food. We are proud of our work to expand access and remove barriers to those essential benefits and services. For clients, it has resulted in shorter wait times and to complete their transactions and a better client experience for our low-touch population, as well as for our clients in need of a more in-depth work intervention. Our workers are spending time helping clients when needed, rather than completing the scanning task, routine routine clients, uh, routing clients manually, and data entry. We are also working to protect against any pro uh, proposed federal cuts that threaten the SNAP program or the nation's other safety net programs, as well as po uh, policies that may harm our immigrant community. Not only would cuts to SNAP be uh, devastating to those New Yorkers who rely on this crucial benefit, it would also harm our local economy. We look forward to continuing collaboration as we work with this council and advocates to protect the enormous gains we have made in recent e uh, years under the de Blasio administration and to fight back against any proposed budget cuts or policies and regulations that harm low-income New Yorkers. I welcome your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Administrator Bonilla. Um, and so I have questions, but I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues actually to ask questions first because I want to be uh, conscientious of their time. So um, each council member will have six minutes to ask questions, and then if we have to do a second round, we can do a second round. Um, but I will start with uh, Council Member Barry Gradenchik with questions. Good afternoon. Thank you, uh, Chair Levin, and thank you for your leadership on this issue. I am uh, delighted to be back on the General Welfare Committee uh, again and uh, welcome all my new colleagues who have joined us. Uh, it's good to see you, Administrator. I, I kind of think like Commissioner, but I guess you're just an Administrator, right? Just so. the Administrator. 
Um, so good afternoon and welcome. And um, there's no question in my mind the great work um, that has occurred uh, under the first four years of Mayor de Blasio's administration. But I do want to cut right to the heart of the matter, and it was about two years ago uh, in January, one of my first hearings, uh, when I was in first uh, of informed of what I described as the appalling uh, number uh, that we provide in this city for emergency food. And uh, as you have heard from um, the speaker uh, this afternoon, and you will hear from uh, people who are here to testify on behalf of uh, so many different entities. I see uh, the Food Bank for New York City is here, of course, and Met Council, and so many others uh, who are really the last line of defense uh, for hungry New Yorkers. Um, so it troubles me greatly um, when I hear and when I read that in the preliminary budget, we are once again dancing with the administration. Uh, last year, Chair Levin and I circulated a, a, a letter that was signed by all 50 council members who are not the speaker. So everybody except for the former speaker, Melissa Mark Viverito, signed that letter. We cannot get all 50 members to agree on what day of the week it is, let alone uh, sign on to uh, emergency food letter. But that ha is how important it is not only to me, but I am certain, I, I don't want to speak for everybody on this panel, but I think I'm reasonably certain that everybody here supports food pantry money. Um, and we as a council, and you heard the speaker's testimony, I know he's very busy and couldn't stay for the whole hearing, but I would like you to take a message back to the administration, and I know uh, I love the people at OMB, um, I love the first deputy mayor, I work with him in Albany as well, um, but this really bothers me. It really bothers me, and, and I don't know if you want to talk about it, um, but it just really uh, cuts me to the quick, so to speak, that we would be talking about this. I know that the chair and I have uh, worked in the past two budgets to increase funding from $11 million to $16 million, and now over $18 million. And I know that HRA spends, what's your budget? It's a lot, yeah, somewhere it's between a lot, a lot and $9 wow. Billion. It's a lot of money. It's 15% it's of the city budget. And I could do the math very quickly, but $19 million really, in the grand scheme of things, represents just over $2 per New Yorker. It won't even get you on the subway. But what it will do is fill, help to feed 1.4 million New Yorkers. So I would really like you to take that message back to the administration. Uh, the, for, the mayor used to be chair of this committee. He understands it as well as anybody. So it, it, it bothers me greatly. But I would like you um, to talk about that a little and uh, your EFAP efforts. Sure. Uh, we appreciate the concern that you have and the concern of this council. Uh, we understand how important it is. Uh, I would be remiss to say that it's, that it's not important to us. It's very important to us. Uh, but we also know that there are a lot of unknowns. We don't know where the federal budget is going to land. Uh, we don't know where the state budget is going to land. And uh, part of our discussion and our collaboration and our partnership is really to look at the whole and figure, and figure this out. So we will continue the conversation. It's still early days. We have not started the executive budget conversation. And we really look forward to working with this council to figure out what the need is. Okay. I'm going to be nice because you're my constituent. So <laughs> I'm going to be really careful here. <laughs> Um, but I do want the message to be heard, and we have the press, of course, is in this room. This council, this person is going to do every single thing he can, not only to make sure that we get back to the number where we are in the FY18 budget, um, but to get back to where, to even a higher number, because nobody, and I think the speaker said this, that nobody should be going hungry in the city of New York. If you look around every single corner of this city, there is building going on, the economy is booming here, and yet in the shadow of greatness, we have hungry people. All right, you know, and that just can't be. Um, I'm an immigrant to New York, to Queens. I came from the Bronx. My family came from the Bronx, so we immigrated from the Bronx. Um, but my, my grandparents, my grandparents came here, the first one came here at Christmas time in 1903. He sailed by the Lady in the Harbor. We're still welcoming people but nobody should go hungry in this city. So I thank you for your work. Um, it's a pleasure to work with you and your team, and I look forward to the next four years of working with you uh, as we explore many, many issues. 
Mr. Chair, with that, I yield my remaining 43 seconds. <laughs> Thank you very much, Councilmember Gudanchik. Uh, I want to turn it over to Councilmember Adrian Adams for questions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you so much for your testimony here today. We really, really appreciate it. All of your hard work and your efforts uh, that you continue to do for our great city, for our constituents. Uh, I just want to personally thank you for that. Um, as a representative from Southeast Queens, I didn't uh, take it very lightly uh, to find out that um, the, um, I believe it, your, your, acronym, your acronym is ABA WD. Um, waiver, um, able-bodied adults without dependents, uh, very noticeable that um, this is a waiver that is applicable uh, to those who are unemployed or underemployed to receive SNAP uh, when they can't find at least 80 hours of work per month. And uh, what's even more telling to me is that the, uh, the update that was made last year singled out uh, Queens as no longer being eligible for, for, this, uh, for this waiver, uh, except for the area of Community District 12, uh, which happens to be the district that I'm responsible for, one of them that I'm responsible for. So it's very, very disheartening to me uh, to echo the um, sentiments of my colleague in that in the year 2018, we are still facing pretty much uh, an epidemic um, of, uh, of uh, people that are really, really in need of food and, and, and a hunger <laughs> epidemic here. That said, uh, my district is very, very diverse. We have very specific issues, um, and uh, I, I'm very interested to know that uh, we've heard from providers that work with immigrant communities that uh, mm -hmm. the fear of potential repercussions have had an impact on undocumented families whose children qualify for SNAP. Is HRA taking any initiative to work with or reassure clients that their children can avail their SNAP benefits without a run-in with ICE? Thank you, Councilman, for that uh, question. Uh, like I said in my testimony, our outreach efforts are vast. Uh, we try to reach every community where we think there may be any stigma, uh, any fear to come in and apply. It is the reason we work with community-based organizations because we understand uh, very clearly that they're the first line of defense to many communities that may not uh, want to come into a government office to apply for benefits. Uh, those outre the outreach that we perform is uh, diverse for that reason. Uh, thank you, just to follow up. Do we know what the current trend is right now in Southeast Queens as far as uh, new SNAP applications? Are we seeing an increase or a decrease specifically in Southeast Queens? I'm happy to get back to you with that specific. Thanks very answer. much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilmember Adams. Uh, Councilmember Diana Ayala. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you uh, for your testimony today, Grace. Um, I, have a, I have a couple of questions because I, as a former director of constituent services, this is an issue that's really important to me as a former child whose mother raised her on the, uh, the SNAP uh, benefits. Um, this is a program that's also really important to me uh, for personal reasons. Um, it allowed my mother the peace of mind and knowing that her kids went to bed at night with a full belly. Um, but I have uh, some concerns. So in my district, we have uh, residents that are severely rent uh, burdened. And I wonder, in, your, in the, uh, the eligibility requirements are income-based. Is rent calculated as part of that process? Uh, I'll have uh, our chief program officer answer that question. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, the shelter expense is considered when we're calculating the benefits for SNAP. But for elderly and disabled individuals, that threshold is much higher. There's no cap on the deduction that we allow. For regular earned income households, there's a cap on the deduction. So even if your rent is $1,000 per month, you won't get that full deduction as a consideration towards how much you will receive in SNAP benefits. Why is that? Uh, these are the federal rules, so mm -hmm. we, we administer the program, but through the, the federal and the state governments, we have certain calculations that are authorized through a state computer system, and our workers have to abide by the rules that are applied from the state of New York. And I kid you not, just this afternoon, I went by my district office prior to coming here, and I was checking my mail, and I received a letter from a mother who was 
uh, asking me for assistance for her son, who's a full-time student who uh, has a full scholarship and does not qualify for SNAP benefits because of that. She's a single mother on SSI who cannot afford to supplement her son's income monthly. And she's very concerned that her son is going hungry because he's being penalized for having received a full scholarship to go to school. And so my question is, what efforts is HRA you know, uh, taking to ensure that college students are not being penalized in this way? The um, student eligibility rules are very similar to the rules that we have for the able-bodied adults without dependents. If you are a full-time student, in order to receive food stamps, and these are the federal rules, these are not rules that New York City gets to make determinations on, but if you're a student, then you have to be in a work-study program, a federally funded work-study program, or working at least 80 hours per month or in order to receive food stamp benefits. So most, many of our full-time students who are not working or participating in a work program are not, unfortunately, eligible for a SNAP. Yeah, that's unfortunate because, I mean, I haven't been in college in a really long time, but when I was there, I know that the, the work-study program was a very competitive uh, program and that oftentimes if you didn't get there quick enough, you miss an opportunity to benefit from it. Um, and my frustration that, you know, the frustration that you're seeing on my face is not directed at HRA, but rather at, you know, the continued barriers that the federal government places on individuals that are most in need. And so I, it, it's obvious that we need, there's a lot more that we need to do. Yeah. And Council, and you hit the nail on the head. Um, I, I think that from our perspective, there is more that we wish we could do. And if this is a space where there could be collaboration with the council uh, to make sure that we are decreasing barriers to people that need this benefit the most. I appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Ayala, and I, I too share your frustration. I, I, this is one of the things that raises my blood pressure on a, on a very frequent basis uh, with constituents who um, get minimum benefits um, but are still well below the, 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 the poverty line. And, um, um, you know, we need to in, do everything that we can uh, to truly minimize those barriers. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that Access NYC um, will will help to streamline some of this. Will help to uh, if there are miscommunications in terms of reporting or misreported uh, numbers that okay. that people will then be able to know, uh, or if there's missing documentation, other barriers to people getting their benefits, um, so that quite frankly that it doesn't take Councilmember Ayala or Councilmember Levin to call Administrator Bonilla on Friday afternoon at 4:35. And, uh, and say what's going on with these benefits. Right. That, well, I'm always, I serve at the pleasure. So you get, you're always, a, you can call me at any time. But uh, the Access HRA tool is exactly that. It is an mm -hmm. opportunity to give clients a window into their benefits so they know exactly what documents we have, exactly when their next appointment is. And I do want to thank some of the members of this committee because I know that you've been working very hard with our external affairs team to ensure that those tools are available in your offices and with the mm -hmm. community-based organizations that you work with. It's very so important. So it's a work in progress, for As sure. As you know, council members get very um, frustrated on behalf of their constituents. I'm personally aware, yes, yes sir. Yes. Um, okay, we'll turn it over to Council Member Bradlander. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and it's, uh, it is very good to be back uh, on this committee with you. And I just do want to reflect, having taken four years off, uh, how different the conversation we're having from my first term on this uh, committee when you were not its chair, but you were uh, on here with me. And, you know, at that point we were fighting against SNAP fingerprinting, yes. right? We were Abad dealing... Waiver. Hmm. The ABOD waiver. The waiver, you know, we were dealing with the challenge that people were being consistently suspended in very high numbers for missed appointments, which I know still on occasion happens, but that the move to so many online appointments has helped a lot. Um, you know, and it felt at that time that there was essentially an effort to uh, keep people from getting the benefits that they were eligible for rather than build tools to expand the ones that people are eligible for. So uh, not that that's all here, here. entirely due to your chairing this committee, uh, but uh, both to you and to the administration for the work that has gone in over the last four years to make my coming back onto this committee uh, quite different than it was. Um, and because others, of course, shout out their local uh, outstanding emergency food providers, I have to give a big shout out to Alexander Rappaport and Maspia for the extraordinary work that they do in my district and all around the city. Um, 
Uh, having said that, I do. I just need to add my voice on EFAP. Um, you guys have done such extraordinary work. You've got this incredible record of things that you've done. Having you guys come here and us have to say, come on, with EFAP, like, I, it doesn't serve anybody well. Um, get it in the executive budget. We won't have to do it at the executive budget hearing. This stuff should be baselined. It just, we, what, what we want is, right, the, what, the fairest city in the country, the fairest city in the country baselines its emergency food. So let's just get it done. Um, and then we can just focus on all the, all the good work that you guys are doing and, and what its next steps are. Um, uh, one other EFAP question I want to ask about, I guess, is really from the view of making things even a little easier still for the providers. I know that one thing they're looking for is to have that be more order based rather than kind of random distribution. It's my understanding that with federal and state food, they can use the web to place their orders from food bank that we're trying to get there on EFAP, but we're not quite there yet. So obviously you've done good work with Plentiful and all this other technology. Um, can you tell us, give me an update on kind of how that, where that pilot is and, and how soon <coughs> it'll be possible for folks to do order orders for their EFAP, the food? So if I'm understanding your question correctly, Council Member, um, we did have a pilot through the City Council that uh, looked at how we can order food in a different way. Uh, I believe that took uh, place for a number of years. Uh, when that pilot ended and the, f and the money was baselined, we were subject to the procurement uh, rules that any other city agency is subject to, and we do use DCAS to purchase food. That said, my understanding from the team uh, is that we are looking at, we're, we're speaking to different uh, pantries, and like anyone else in New York City, they each want different things. So for those that would prefer an online platform, we are speaking to them to see what that would look like. Others prefer to uh, <coughs> buy, purchase the food the way they're purchasing it now. Uh, so we are doing a deep dive to see uh, where we can get to a more uniform process. Okay, well, if you could just keep giving, you know, give me uh, some updates on that. I know, at least again, I'm, you know, most of what I know here comes either from chips or from Masbia, um, but I know Masbia is able for their city and state provided food through the food bank to do online ordering, and that makes it a lot easier for them. And if they could do that for EFAP, uh, it would make it easier for them to manage their food and connect that to the meals. So um, I hope that's something we'll be able to either resume doing. And if we need to find some procurement workaround, please talk to us, um, and we'll see if there's ways that we could work together. But yeah. we'd like and to we're, we're happy to reach out to the provider as well and see what the barriers are. Okay, so thank, thank you. So thank you for letting us um, and if you could just uh, talk a little about what you're doing in the, the context on federal immigration to make sure that immigrant New Yorkers know they can access emergency food without fear. Um, obviously, we, you know, in every aspect of government service right now, we want to make people know, make sure people know they're welcome, they can keep coming, we don't turn their information over, we don't let ICE officers walk into our city facilities. We want to make sure I think people know that. I guess I don't know whether you've had a dialogue with the emergency food providers about what they're supposed to do if ICE shows up at the door. What are we doing to protect immigrant New Yorkers and make sure they know that emergency food access uh, is there uh, for them? So like I, I've said in my testimony, uh, we are making sure that our outreach plan is diverse so that we are reaching out to every possible a community that feel, feels that they cannot come in for whatever reason, immigration or other reason. The reasons that the Access HRA platform is so important is because communities that may fear coming in don't have to actually come in. Um, they can actually apply and uh, call us for on their on-demand interviews, submit documents. Uh, so all of the reasons that you're stated that may cause people not to come in, there's actually another way to get this done, and but we are getting the word out there that that is a platform that people should use. Okay, but I don't know if that's the best. I mean, I guess I'm not sure for folks who fee you know, who are undocumented and who are fearing to make themselves more visible puts them at risk. That, that I mean, I'm all for access mm -hmm. HRA, and I mm -hmm. think it solves a lot of problems, but I'm not sure it's the best way to get undocumented folks access to emergency food at a time when they rightly fear the federal government is has an increased appetite for deportation. I mean, the, the numbers are way up, we heard from the NYPD last week. We so. are working with our providers to make sure that we are having a dialogue around immigration and status. Okay, um, I guess if I'd, I'd love to know a little more what, uh, you know, and if you want to follow, you know, provide it by follow-up. Follow 
Well, and it sounds, you know, I don't, I don't need it at this minute. It's not the question of the extra minute. I, I just, you know, this is something I feel like everybody has to be paying attention to. That's your providers as well as you. This is a scary time, um, and we don't want to make people more scared, but we want to make sure people have the information they need um, and that we're just being thoughtful in each place. We didn't think ICE would start coming into the courts, um, but they are. Um, I don't want to like scare people. I don't think they're starting to come into our emergency food providers. At the same time, I want to make sure our systems are really thoughtful to make sure we're communicating with people in a real productive way and we just you know, put folks at ease and make sure nobody's going hungry out of fear uh, of ICE. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Lander. Uh, Councilmember Heimdeutsch. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first of all, I don't want to be put in the same position as my colleagues. So I want, if you, the panel could affirm that if you don't live in my district, you're not constituents, please. <laughs> and, uh, okay, no, was just, that was a joke. <laughs> but it definitely is, it definitely is today a beautiful Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Not Tuesday. Quiet. Okay, Not I have quiet. to disagree with it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, during your testimony, we also, you mentioned that, um, you know, we don't know what kind of federal and state funding we will have. But you know, first of all, when it comes to hunger, um, I don't think we should um, rely that only on federal and state, that if we don't get the resources we need from the federal and state government, we need to continue making sure that here in the city level, that whatever needs to get done, the funding and resources uh, that go for those that, uh, that go hungry um, and those less fortunate should continue and we should not even um, uh, go back and, and to even mention that because we need to make sure that as our jobs and our, as um, you know, we are the ones that they look for for the resources that they need uh, to survive each and every day. Uh, but I was looking at the beautiful presentation, your online portal, and my question is, is that um, we have 60,000 plus homeless people in the city. Mm -hmm. And you have a beautiful, beautiful portal. Um, but when it comes to 60,000 people who don't have access to computers, you know, when you have 60,000 people who don't have a return address, when you have 60,000 people that don't have access to a phone, and when you have 60,000 people that are living out there in the streets. So when the, one of the first things you do when it comes to a person that is homeless is to give them the kickstart. And that kickstart is to, for them to apply to SNAP. So this way they could survive with those resources. But without a mailing address, this, it's impossible for them to receive any type of benefits. So what is HR doing, HRA doing, in order to reach out to those 60,000 people and to make sure, making sure that they have access uh, to SNAP? Uh, so thank you for your question. I think that one of the huge benefits of the integration of HRA and DHS is uh, that we are working better uh, together to figure out how we get this to providers that are working with our homeless community. Uh, so you should know that uh, we have a, a huge number of people in the DHS system that have access to our benefits. And as far as the pro provider portal that we also featured uh, in the demo, it is a, a critical uh, touch point, especially for providers that are working with homeless families, because now they have a partner that is helping them manage their account. So what we do know about homeless families is that they, they do have access to uh, mobile phones. Uh, we also know that uh, providers have access to actual phones that, and they've been helping them th through this process. So part of our, our, uh, of our external affairs plan is really to work with DHS homeless providers so that they have access to these tools because we recognize, in fact, that our DHS New Yorkers, our f folks that are in the DHS system, are the ones that could use it the most. So we are very much uh, have them top of mind when we're thinking about these tools. So how do they receive benefits? So a home, uh, someone who is homeless provi uh, applies for <coughs> benefits like anybody else. We actually have uh, a team that goes out as part of their uh, move out uh, portfolio. They go out and help people apply for benefits. 
Uh, many of our homeless clients have PO boxes that they use. Uh, providers assist them with. Uh, How many of the 60,000 plus people have uh, an address where they can receive the benefits? Do you have a number on that? I will have to get back to you. But we don't, we don't need one second. Could you take a guess or an estimate? Would it be 10 out of 60,000? You don't actually have to have a, um, a residential address in order to receive food stamps. Yeah, but how do you res but you need still need to receive some type of <coughs> documentation that you will be getting the benefits. So um, through Access HRA, we think that it's actually better for homeless individuals because they can track what's happening with their cases. They can track their notices from HRA. They can see their appointments. How can they track so it? Through the system. So, so if, if someone's living in the street, how can they track it through the system? They can go to a library. We go to community-based organizations. Some of our shelters, I believe, also have computer systems available. As, um, so if you have someone there. sleeping in the street for, let's say, two weeks and hasn't taken a shower, and you think the library is going to be easy access for them to come inside to use a computer? So, so council member, one of the things that I do want to recognize is that the majority of our homeless population is not is not living on the street, right? We do know, and thanks to the team here, we have 43,500 people uh, out of the 60,000 that you mentioned that are currently receiving SNAP benefits. Um, so we know that it's accessible to them. We also know that the d homeless population is diverse. We have families, we have singles, we have folks with mental illness, and each of them require a different type of outreach. But I can tell you that with 43,000 people receiving SNAP benefits uh, that who are homeless currently, we are reaching the lion's share of families, children, and singles that need this benefit. So what happens to the other 17,000? We still have in-office services. They can come into our offices to receive services. The beauty of having a tool that decreases the foot traffic is that we can really zero in on the population that actually needs it. So if we were to have someone that in your, uh, in your description was street homeless, we are still have a presence in, in the community. We also have a presence through our CBOs. So um, just for the record, I just want to state that from the 17,000, if you service 43,500 out of the 60,000. So the rest of the people, 17,000 approximately, that are still out in the street, they can reach out to an agency or come into a library, but we don't have a number, and obviously you don't have a number of, of from those 17,000, I believe it's a lot more than 17,000, that's besides the point, but from those 17,000, so we don't know if those people have any type of SNAP benefits or services. So I just wanted to mention for the record that there are thousands of people out there living in the streets that we have no clue if they receive SNAP and uh, they're forced to beg in the street and to, to go around and those are the people you might see standing on the highway, standing on the street corners uh, who don't receive these benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Deutsch. Uh, Councilmember Mark Jonai. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, certainly, uh, there's quite a bit of passion, um, understandably, uh, why. I do want to echo, most of the questions have been asked by my colleagues, but I do want to echo some of their comments when it comes to baselining, um, listen to the budget. I think we can take this political football and put it to rest and do what's right by all New Yorkers, especially when it comes to something so important as making sure everyone has an opportunity to participate and take advantage of these programs. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Jonai. Um, okay, so I'm gonna uh, start on, on, uh, on my question. So I just wanna make it clear for the record uh, what the preliminary budget does with regard to EFAP. And uh, this, uh, I gotta admit, I, have some, I find it challenging sometimes to follow the numbers. So um, I'm going to break it down uh, for the last uh, say two fiscal years and then we'll talk about uh, prelim 19, okay? If that's right. Uh, fiscal 18, uh, we have a total of $20,636,000 spent on EFAP. That broken down is $8.573 million in baseline city funding that is $2.888 million in federal funding. 
That is $4.9 million in one year funding by the administration. And that is $3.68 million in council funding. That's FY17, and that totals $20,636. Um, that's a significant jump from the FY16. So we we'll just want to put that on the record. So 16, the total was $15,468. So that was, that was uh, over a uh, $5 million jump. And that was in one time, that the, the lion's share of that was in one time um, uh, administration funding as well as, uh, as one year council funding. We can only do one year council funding. We can't baseline. So FY18, uh, it increased by uh, a little over $2 million again. This is the same 8.573 million baseline funding, the same 2.888 million in federal funding, the one time uh, non baseline admin funding 7.2 million. So that was up from 4.9 to 7.2 from fiscal 17 to 18. And then the council increased, or no, the council sorry, had a small decrease to 3.275 from their previous year of 3.68. Um, that total then is 22,936,000. And that's the total FY18. So prelim FY19, what is it as proposed in the, in the prelim? As I stated in my testimony, council member, it is not proposed in the prelim. It will be part, we will discuss this as part of the executive budget process. But the 8.573, that's baseline, that's in the prelim. That is in the prelim. Right. And then the federal funding is in the prelim. So what's not in the prelim is the 7.2 plus the council funding. Um, so obviously that's very disappointing. So I'm going to quote uh, a very wise, sage person here. Uh, the most striking thing to me is in terms of, of EFAP. Now we've heard, I think, some very powerful statistics from advocates and from providers about the continued need, in fact, the increased need for food assistance. I think we all agree that there is a troubling economic situation brewing in our city. We could certainly see, we're certainly seeing the impact in our city budget. Uh, now, so I can't believe that the situation of hunger in the city is going to naturally get better in the coming year. Unfortunately, I fear it's going to get worse. Um, the preliminary budget, sorry, I'm skipping ahead. Uh, the preliminary budget allows for nine point $8 million, $9.885 million for emergency food programs, and that is a very noticeable reduction from what was actually spent in the last fiscal year, just over $13 million, excuse me, $13 million, I believe. And even more striking is the comparison to 2006, where $17 million was spent. So we see we have gone now, we're not quite half of where we were in 2006 in terms of spending on emergency food where at the same time the problem is certainly not getting better and I fear it's getting substantially worse. Skipping ahead, the council has always been willing to be a part of the solution here. I think you know it's been a priority for us. We are not the executive branch and my concern here is that the substantial reduction over the last few years in emergency food funding where again the problem is getting worse. skipping ahead, and as, the, as you said in November, the federal situation is very troubling. The federal commitment to these programs has reduced in the last few years. I'm not saying there isn't a fiscal problem to be addressed. I just don't understand why hunger issues are not such a priority. There's a lot of valid needs, but I can't think of any more fundamental as hunger as an issue we have to address. So I'm just not clear. Unless you're telling me that there's some new additional source of federal source of funding, that's filling this gap. It seems to me that that this is something that needs to be adjusted in the executive budget. That is, former chairman of this committee, Bill de Blasio, in March 2008. Um, so, you can applaud our our mayor for his uh, for his prescience. Um, so, I recommend we we heed the advice of then uh, Councilmember Bill de Blasio and rectify this in the executive budget. The numbers that we were talking about 
um, sadly, are not all that different uh, than they were back then. Um, and we've seen, obviously, the cost of housing, as you noted in your testimony, grow up so significantly uh, since, since then, 10 years ago. Um, we, need, uh, we need to baseline this funding in the executive budget. Um, you know, I would like Council Member de Blasio to be very proud of Mayor de Blasio in such an action. The preliminary budget is the beginning of a conversation, as you know, and we will continue that conversation. We understand the importance of this. Thank you. Thank you. I'd just like to thank Rabia Kwasim, who was our legal fellow, for finding that <laughs> testimony, finding the, uh, going back into the, you know, the old files. Um, so, okay. So, uh, questions around EFAP. Um, how, how does HRA, uh, look at the EFAP, um, you mentioned before about the purchase of EFAP food is based on analysis of the needs and trends of the EFAP network. What analysis, what is this analysis and how is that analysis conducted and what metrics are being used? Sure. Uh, I'd like to turn it over to Marie Phillip, our Deputy Commissioner. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so EFAP uh, basically provides over 40 different food items, and as was stated, it's done through an analysis, which is done through the food uh, network, which is talking with our providers, talking with our community-based organizations who are a part of the network to determine the needs for the particular communities. Um, in terms of actual metrics, uh, we can probably get that to you. Um, we don't have that specifically here, but it's through communicating with our food networks and determining the particular needs for those communities. So for the overall picture, in other words, what goes into the preliminary budget, the baseline amount for, for, for EFAP, what metric is used to determine uh, that amount year after year? Obviously it hasn't, it hasn't changed year after year, um, so um, is there, is there a, a consideration for on the ground data in terms of um, uh, where the needs are in terms of the meal gap. I mean, are, are, are you, I mean, that's, so that's a big picture question, mm -hmm. citywide. It's certainly part of the conversation. Uh, we, we can get back to you to see what, ex what the exact metrics are. Mm -hmm. Okay. In terms of how the actual distribution of EFAP is determined, what metrics are used for that? In other words, are you, are you coordinating meal gap data to EFAP distribution outcomes? The information that we use is combined with food collaborative information as well as EFAP distribution information in terms of what we actually do. Um, so uh, Barbara can talk about the supply gap a little bit more, but we are looking also again at our providers, our EFAP membership, and how they are able to distribute food as well. So a lot of our programs, um, though we, uh, we have a range of programs, those that can do um, at a high level of distribution and those that are not able to. It's also based on uh, capacity issues, uh, the ability to store the food, and the ability of those programs to distribute the food. We have small programs and we have larger programs that actually are more organized and structured in terms of having staff to distribute food. And we have small storefront um, providers also who use volunteers and so may be quite limited in terms of their ability to distribute at a higher level and to store the food as well. So can I ask then a hypothetical question? Um, because you spoke about distribution capacity um, you know, ability uh, to supply the food or pass along the food um, of these particular providers. Um, what if you were to have uh, in a community district, sub-district, um, a, uh, a high meal gap as evidenced by uh, the analytics that you were to do or that the food bank were to do, uh, to identify a meal gap, and then in that same community subdistrict, you have a provider that does not have that type of capacity. So aside from aside from being able to 
build up their capacity, which is, I think, one thing that we would look to do. And I know that Barbara's been working on that. And aside from just advancing their capacity, how then are you? Is is more food going to meet the need? I mean, are you are you contemplating need in that equation as well, not just capacity and um, you know distribution ability? Yeah. Um, so for the record, my name is Barbara Turk. I'm the director of food policy in the mayor's office. And council member, what you're describing is. Um, very similar to the approach that the Food Assistance Collaborative is now taking. You know, when you sit around and talk about, just to give you a little bit of an overview, as you know, when you sit around and talk about a, the number of people who are food insecure being 1.25 million, and you think about the meal gap being as high as it is, um, and you think about what goes into those metrics and how they're built, um, they really are not granular enough, or they're not as granular as we would like them to be, they're useful but they're not as granular as we would like them to be in order to actually make delivery, you know, planning, do planning for where we need more capacity. And so what the Food Assistance Collaborative did as its first goal together was to set, figure out what a common denominator would be that we could actually see increase or decrease and make some judgments about what neighborhoods were undersupplied. Because you also know, I think everybody here knows that the food, food supply is, you know, it's, these are volunteer organizations for the most part. Um, there are some very large ones that distribute a large share of the food in New York, but there are a lot of, you know, there are hundreds of smaller ones. And um, they change, they come, they go. And as we look at what's happening with supply in New York City, we have neighborhoods that do pretty well. When we look at the, the um, the meal gap and we subtract the amount of food that's going in there in a snapshot that we've created, we can say, oh, the, the, the meal gap, you know, the food supply gap is not as great. And then there are neighborhoods across the city where it is actually profoundly large. And the, the group decided that what they would do is set a target and they would say, okay, what's the average meal gap across the city? And which neighborhoods are above that? Or the average supply gap? What neighborhoods are above that supply gap? and what neighborhoods are below it. And we have a long list. We haven't finished it, you know. But we were in 12. Uh, we want to do more. Um, the funding for EFAP, uh, this, this is the first time. I, I would just offer you a little history here, which is we can go back and take a look at what metrics were used to build the, that number, but I don't know that they exist because this has been a discretionary program since its inception in the early 1980s. And at this, so we've been guessing, right? So now we actually have something to hang, a, hang our hats on. And even still, um, I would go out on a limb in this hearing and say that um, when we look at what it would take to fully close those gaps, it's, it's, um, it's much, much larger. Um, than what we will, you know, the, than what we've been supplying. Yes, but what, and it's very significantly larger, and then raises questions about whether we have the distribution capacity to do that overnight. But we have added 90. We've either built out the capacity of, or added an additional 90 pantries in the course of this effort, um, and we will continue on that road. And we have a good roadmap here. Yeah. The the. The uh, neighborhoods that you've identified that have a greater supply gap than other neighborhoods that may be facing <coughs> similar challenges in terms of uh, the number of people living in poverty um, is is the, some neighborhoods will have a, a, a less of a supply gap because of existing capacity. So there just happens to be a, a pantry that is uh, well established and has. Yeah. You know, greater access to refrigeration. And there's a long history, you know, in neighborhoods like Southeast Queens um, mm -hmm. and specifically in Jamaica, in central Brooklyn, in Bed-Stuy. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of churches in particular and organizations, faith-based organizations that have done this, been doing this for a very long time. But there are some neighborhoods. But that may or may not track what's going, what's, what, where people are that need that kind of support. Are you able to identify or share with us neighborhoods that do have some of the neighborhoods that have a higher 
Well, supply I can gaps. tell you the 12 neighborhoods that we're in now. And those are the ones identified as having high supply gaps. In yes, the correct. Okay. And um, I can give you that list. I'd be you happy have to do it. I, off the top of your head? Off the top of my head, I could name three or four of them. Sure. Yeah, it'd be um, just as well. Because we've been in, we've been in, in uh, Corona is one, Jackson Heights is one in Queens, um, East Harlem and Washington Heights um, are a couple in Manhattan and the Bronx. I mean, there's neighborhoods in the Bronx, there's neighborhoods in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And then we have three, this is exciting because this is what is exciting to us. We have two, it is actually really wonderful. We have two mobile pantries now in Staten Island because in an area that's less dense, it makes sense to have a mobile operation. And so we now have weekly deliveries that are being coordinated with two organizations in Staten Island. How, are, how is that being coordinated with recipients of the food? How are they, how are they ensuring that they're standing in the right place at the right time? There's a truck. <laughs> right. There's a truck and it's, you know, and we they got- They call the truck driver and say, I'll be ahead. No, 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 no. There's, the there's, there are specific stops that people go to. Uh -huh. And this is another way that we can use the Plentiful app, which is we can broadcast those those stops to people. Okay. We can text them. And how many people are, have the Plentiful app? Uh, the word app? of mouth has been very impressive. Um, as of today, there are 153 pantries that are actually using Plentiful. Mm. Um, and there are 118,627 clients who are using it. And you can That's track good. our progress daily at www.plentifulapp.org. All right. <coughs> and that's available on Android? Available on Android and SMS. Okay. That's so not on, not on i, not on uh, Not on Apple. iPhone, not, on, not iPhone. on the Apple, but you know, you can also, you, you Do the can, SMS. You can, if yeah. you have an Apple phone, you can do the SMS, okay. Yeah, and so, you know, when you go to some of these pantries and soup kitchen, soup, well, pantries, you know, people are now choosing a time that they will show up and they're not standing outside in the cold. It's a big deal. And that's seen, and you've seen a real impact in that? Oh, yeah, we, we, and we have heard so many, you know, all the, I, you know, ask any, I can give you a list of the pantries that are now up and running and the ones that are taking, taking reservations. And all of the pantry directors, this has been a big, this has been a game changer for them. Mm -hmm. And we've given them, at, you know, if they don't have mobile hotspots, we give them a mobile hotspot so it works because they're in a basement or what, you know, whatever it is, right? Mm -hmm. This is all very, we have a group of people who goes out and holds everybody's hand as they're getting on, onboarded onto the program. Great. And it's been really exciting to see how many people are so are are excited about this pro this project. And if there's a pantry out there that's either here in this room or watching on our live stream, watching on our live stream, yes. Uh, how how would they go about uh, signing up for the uh, coordinating with the Plentiful app? Well, all of the plant all the the. the the pantries that have been offered this are the ones that we've expanded, okay. and so they know about it. Mm -hmm. And one of the future planning, the, the immediate planning tasks of the collaborative is figuring out how we scale Plentiful okay. and pot and fund it going forward because it, you know, costs money. Apps apps tend to cost money to maintain and update. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks um, for the questions. I might come back. Uh, how how is how has uh, how has uh, EFAP been affected by uh, HIPNAP cuts, or how's the the our uh, emergency food distribution program um, programs been affected by uh, HIPNAP cuts? And can you just for the record quantify what the HIPNAP cuts are, what HIPNAP is, and what the HIPNAP cuts are? So I can, I'll, I'll give you what I know about this mm -hmm. so far, and there may be other people who testify today to speak to this. Some organizations in New York lost HIPNAP funding, some gained it. Um, so HIPNAP is the state emergency food. That is correct. Program. That is correct. And, it's, and it involves fresh fruits and vegetables. It's, it's, yes, it is the Healthy Food Nutrition Food Program, Assistance Program, right? And also, some of the funding is available. And yeah, some of it's available for, for also for staff. Staff, right. So there were there are at least two organizations I know of that have contacted me that were concerned about the loss of, of, of their HIPNAP funds. Because in and contrast to EFAP, just for folks that don't know, EFAP buys food exclusively, not, not you can't not, do not staff with or. Yeah, you know, the only staff. way you can do staff, 
Yeah, the only way you can sue staff is if you front the money, and we do have a way to do that, but that's something else we wanna, we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna get down that road yet. Sure. Or, or you know, to be continued future. on that in yeah. the future. But what I do wanna say is that, you know, if you call, if those pan, when those pantries called EFAP, not for their staff issues, but when they called EFAP and they said, we lost this, EFAP, you know, EFAP's response was, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll take care of you on food. So, you know, that's... But not the fresh foods, because everything EFAP is shelf-stable, for the most part. Right. Except that's for some canned. refrigerators. It's, it's, it's canned, yeah, mm -hmm. but, it, you know, yeah. again, it's, it, yes, it has to be able to stay in the, in the warehouse for a period of time, yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about that? Right, so the EFAP foods <coughs> are um, stored, the frozen foods or foods that can be stored in the warehouse has been stated. And uh, through EFAP, we will also give administrative um, grants to assist our pantries. Um, so those that have lost that, that funding, mm -hmm. uh, they may have been able to apply for the EFAP administrative grant and receive additional funds. That's true. Um, yeah, and I also, it's important, I don't know if City Harvest is here today, but you know, City Harvest, it's not as if, it's, it, you know, you get EFAP, you only get healthy food if you get HIPNAP. Mm -hmm. You know, the EFAP food, is shelf stable, but that doesn't mean it's full of salt, sugar, and you know, fresh fruits and veggies um, are primarily supplied by City Harvest, and um, so I want to just add that. And they have a, they'll tell you about their planning commitment to increase that as a share of what they deliver. Um, on EFAP, on the there's an RFP out. I don't want to speak specifically about the terms of the RFP. Is that right? There's a I don't believe that's uh, accurate. Mm -mm. I don't think there's an RFP out. Is there an RFP? I can get back to you on that, but I don't think there is an RFP out on EFAP. I think there's no RFP. There's no RFP. So the contract, right, the current contract on EFAP is spanning when to when? I think you may be referring to the uh, warehouse contract. Correct. Yeah. Right. That there's there's a, the bid process. I believe is in at this point, but there's no RFP um, at this point as yet. But there's a bid process going on. So there's a bid process. It's not an RFP. It's not an RFP as yet. Yeah. Okay, because it's pre RFP. Yes. Was there a concept paper released on this? I am not aware of a concept paper, Chris. No, I, we'd have to go back. And, and see if that okay. was fine. Yep. Because this is, this is an area where, you know, in terms of, you know, how procurement works with EFAP, it's something that, you know, we've heard from providers mm -hmm. over the years. And as you may know, we, there was a portion, there was a period of time when there was a portion of EFAP that the council provided and it had a different model. Procurement worked a different way because it was not done. Mm -hmm. It wasn't done in, I think it was an advanced, advanced purchase by uh, DCAS. It was, you know, uh, uh, Food Bank was able to do a more flexible type of ordering uh, right, program with, uh, with, with providers. Mm -hmm. And we heard at the time that providers liked that flexibility because it allowed them to buy things that they wanted at when they wanted it and not, you know, you know, get the whatever it is, the, you know, the, the many cans of corn when they really need beans or whatever. So um, my, my question is just that I, 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 with this particular bidding process, um, I was expecting that there might be some public input into how it was uh, configured so that, you know, potential flexibility might be uh, optimized or uh, utilizing um, technological advancements that Barbara's been working on or things things that could um, could could improve the current distribution and warehousing could be could be written into a bidding process in a way that if there was something like a concept paper with a comment period could um, you know could allow for something like that Council, I, unfortunately, I don't have the details on that, and mm -hmm. I, I would ask for to give us an opportunity to sure. go back and see where we are in the process. Okay. I would just also add, I believe the program that you're referring to, Councilman, is an older program that is no longer yeah, no, I know. in place, right? It got, because it, it got, because the money got baselined and it all went over to correct. DCAS, and correct. we heard from providers that they said, you know, shucks, 
we liked it the way that it used to be right. because we were, had some flexibility. So I think, I mean, that, my, my point is that that flexibility was lost when, that, when, that, when those funds got baselined. And, you know, if there's a new RFP that were to be going out where this contract were to be, is, is, is being reissued um, in a competitive process, oftentimes, I mean, like when HRA did, um, you know, the employment plan, exactly. you know, an extensive concept paper with public comment period was put out. It allowed for a lot of input. That input was incorporated into the RFP. Um, and, you know, I don't know what the status <coughs> is or what the stage is. I just first heard about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, if there was an opportunity for public input so that there's, you know, adjustments that could be made instead of just reissuing the same, you know, basically the same contract that was in effect sure. during the previous contract round. So let, give us an opportunity to sure. go back and see where we are in the pro, uh, procurement process, uh, and we'll give you a more, a more accurate response. Um, sure, just going back to the meal gap, does, does HRA, um, do you guys index the meal gap, or do you, do you, uh, you know, do you have a... Uh, when you say index, what do you mean? Or do you... you do you uh, quantify the meal gap in a uh, per and, and, and in terms of neighborhood and, and when you said granular, how granular do you get? So um, the meal gap is. Um, uh oh. That's it. That's it. Yeah, lights out. <laughs> the meal gap was developed uh, by Feeding America. Uh, food banks team has, because we are such a dense city, has done a closer look at the meal gap and how it's spread out around the city. And that information is available for all of you to see in a map that is found in the food metrics report that we produce for the city council uh, annually. It's on our website. We were able to get information at a neighborhood, at an NTA level, and I always have to remember what NTA stands for, but it's a neighborhood, neighborhood level that's less than a zip code. And I believe it's small. neighborhood tabulation area. Yes, it right? is neighborhood tabulation yeah. area, because when I hear it, yeah, that's correct. So it's at a neighborhood tabulation uh, uh, level. And when we did all the, the prioritization where we had a couple of adjacent NTAs that were, you know, we sometimes merged them into a clearer community and so forth and so on. But we did that and that's how we've tried to take the, the meal gap and um, understand it in relationship to the supply that's going out already. Because the meal gap, you know, it has a lot of economic metrics in it. Um, it's hard to turn, you know, unless you turn that into pounds and do some modeling, right? And we could certainly take that through, you know, take you through that, what we did. Um, We've done that technical briefing uh, before, and I don't know that we've ever done it for the city council, but I would offer that to you if you want to see it. You reminded me about pounds. So the food don't forget the pounds. Right. So the food assistance collaborative. And pounds so translate into dollars. You know, it's a thing. But your so the goal is to distribute ten million more pounds. That's correct. Now, and I went back and, I, and for, before in the testimony, the current EFAP pounds distributed per year is twelve million. So that. So the goal is to essentially double, for the food assistance collaborative, the goal is to almost double almost, the, yeah. the, 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 amount, the number of pounds to go out. Mm -hmm. How many more pounds ha are going out as of today since the inception of the food assistance collaborative? You'd have to look at that. Do you have it? You'd have to look at that. I, I want to just, yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to give you the wrong number. Okay. Um, but the idea was do you know was to in some cases create the capacity to even take those pounds. So we went from neighborhood to neighborhood and ground truth some of the stuff. We walked into pantries and we said, you know, our targets tell us that we need to put three or four hundred thousand more pounds into this neighborhood. Could you take what would it take for you to take fifty thousand or a hundred thousand? And then we found four or five pantries who could do that. And then we also asked, you know, in Jackson Heights we asked, you know, make the road. You know, how would you like to run a pantry? And they, but said they, yes. say, they said yes. Of course they did. And um, and uh, some people said no, but most people said yes. Most nonprofits said yes. So that's basically how we did this. This has been very shoe leathery, a shoe leather process of really doing organizing among pantries and figuring out where who can take more 
who could take more if they had what, and then grant proposals come before this, the, the, the group, before the Food Assistance Collaborative, for the hard costs of building out that capacity, and then we get it done. That's how it goes. Um, I'm just going to uh, hop around a little bit here. Food help. Uh, yeah. NYC. So I, I, it was a little bit unclear to me from the testimony. What what does food help do? What is it? What's uh, if you were to go to food help? Or who goes to food help and why do they go and what does it do for them? Uh, essentially, it was a campaign to build awareness on uh, all the diverse food resources that are out there. SNAP being one of them. Um, I'm. Do we know what? It also uh, gives the list of pantries uh, throughout the neighborhood so people can see uh, where they can go to a food pantry. Um, and it right, links the uh, SNAP information as well. And it links to Access HRA. Correct, it does. Access HRA and through 311. So I'm really excited about this Access HRA. I think this is, this very has excited great about potential. It. Yes, great so potential. Very much. Um, uh, so if somebody uh, uh, has an issue recertifying, they can do it all through Access HRA. Yes. Right? If they get a letter saying, you know, your SNAP benefit was discontinued, if somebody calls me and says, uh, uh, what, what happened to my SNAP benefit, I can, instead of, instead of uh, calling uh, Administrator Bonilla at 445 on a Friday, I can first go with them through their Access HRA and see what it's saying to them, and it'll flag. You might be missing this piece of documentation. That's correct. Uh, the one piece that we've also uh, removed a barrier on is the interview. Mm -hmm. So they would still have to call and have their interview, but instead of coming in person, instead of having it be a face-to-face, -face, mm -hmm. it's uh, now through our call centers specifically for SNAP app applicants and recipients. This is a little bit outside of the jurisdiction of this committee hearing, but the same goes for, for public assistance, cash assistance, and um, and Medicaid, or no? Just well, Medicaid is a little more complicated, as uh -huh. you know. There's uh, the the state through the exchange accepts applications. Uh, the city is still speaking to the state about how the uh, the rest of the cases will move over to the state, and there's no set deadline on that. Uh, with cash assistance. Uh, so if you have, I'm sorry. So if you have a Medicaid case, you can't you can't find your docs on on Access HRA for recertifications and for just yes, different hearing. But yeah, uh, sorry, for dis it's okay. We'll get uh, there. For disabled, agent blind, and folks that are recertifying, they would still come to through HRA uh -huh. for new applications. They're not going to the exchange and are part of the state system. But those that have it through HRA are still with HRA. They are still with HRA. And their and their and their info is on their access HRA. No, no. it's not. Uh, so part of the state taking over the program is that there will be a state platform if they so choose to do that. So Medicaid, uh, there for the last number of years since 2015, I believe 20, 2015. The state, can the state? I'm sorry, but can the state give HRA the authority to have? somebody's Medicaid case on Access HRA? I mean, is that something that you that can negotiate with OTDA? That is a much longer conversation. Um, uh -huh. And I believe the state has their own platform. The exchange is that platform. OK. Uh, so it is, it is separate. Uh, Except for, for those that, but so then there's a, there's a gap there for those that enrolled in Medicaid with HRA, not with the state, but like, you know, they're not on the state exchange. They're, they got their Medicaid through, through the city. Those that have had Medicaid for more than five years, so we, uh, the, it's still a state benefit that we would administer. Uh, right. the, the thinking is that it's a, a program that would be administered less and less by the city. So the but those cases that you are still administering, they don't have access to their info. Not if they're Medicaid only. No, they do not. Okay. Yeah. Right. And it's a much longer, complicated conversation that I'm, I'm happy to engage you with. Okay. For cash assistance, it yeah. is different. Uh, there's still a face-to-face. -face. Uh, uh, while you can open an Access HRA account and have information on your account, mm -hmm. um, there are still things that you're going to have to come in and. and so if it tells for. you you're over income, it'll tell you. Will tell you why you're over income. This is a big pet peeve of mine. Well, it'll tell you why you're over income. How over income you are. Why mm -hmm. you're over income.
you're living off of seven hundred and fifty dollars a month in SSD with two kids, and it says you're over income, you know, it'll tell you well, why so you're over income. Well, I, I'm gonna let our chief program officer answer. I don't think that we should get into the specifics of any that's a, case. That's a that's a hypothetical. But that is, I, I, I appreciate that hypothetical. Yeah. So. Yeah. The client can access HRA notices on Access HRA. Cash assistance clients can submit their recertifications from the comfort of their homes through Access HRA. In order to apply on a Access HRA, they have to come in to one of our facilities mm -hmm. or a community-based organization that has an HRA staff member outstationed at the facility. The information about case specifics is on Access HRA. Okay. But we do not upload at this point the state notices. So what you're referring to would be a state notice, a state client notice system notice, and that notice tells people exactly the reason for the closing, and it should have a calculation of the budget. That information has not yet made it to Access HRA. But, but hopefully it will. Yeah, we're still working and negotiating with the state to see what notices we can upload but all of our HRA-generated notices are in the system. Okay. The more collaboration, I think, the better in terms of a client experience, you know. We're certainly in constant co conversations with OTDA mm -hmm. uh, to enhance uh, this particular tool. Mm -hmm. So we are in those conversations. Yeah. Um, so there are people that are not online, as Councilor Deutsch said. Point of service SNAP enrollment, that is what's happening there? Is that expanding? Is that staying the same? Is that being reduced? Are you talking about our footprint and uh, from a SNAP perspective? Yeah. We will always have a footprint in the community. Um, that footprint may look slightly different depending on what the... Uh, By different you mean the same size, but configured differently or configured smaller? Configured differently. Not configured smaller. Differently. There's be no that reduction is part of, the of conversation. funds. That is so part of the conversation and what we're learning through, it, it, again, in this particular process, it is still early days. We've only seen a reduction in our foot traffic on the SNAP side last year. Uh, what it will continue to look like, we will, we will see. It gives us an opportunity to look at more vulnerable populations to see who needs what in what neighborhood. Right, as you know, neighborhoods have changed. So those are all conversations that we are having uh, as far as making sure that we are where our clients are. Are you in every senior center in the city for SNAP enrollment? We are not in every senior center in the city. I can tell you that we have worked in the last year with 52 senior centers. Uh, part of, again, I know that I keep talking about Access HRA, but part of our campaign with the senior community is really to teach the folks that are at these senior centers how to use these tools, how to have a provider portal, and how to assist the seniors that are accessing senior centers, um, the benefits that we know that they, they should be able to get. So that is an ongoing campaign in collaboration with, with the council, as you know. Um, I can also report back that we were at 172 different events targeted to seniors last year to make sure that they know and are aware of, of the SNAP benefit. How many seniors receive SNAP? Give me one second, and I'll let you know. <coughs> and my next question is, how many seniors are <coughs> eligible for SNAP? 424,000 seniors receive SNAP. Sorry, 424,000. 24, okay. And how many are and eligible? That was uh, in December of 2016? 17. So they're 26% of the caseload. Do we have a sense of how many seniors in New York City are eligible for SNAP? I could probably get you that number. Well, actually, what we do know is from it's, it's from a smaller amount. We have looked at um, seniors that are on Medicaid and not on SNAP that could be eligible for SNAP, and we have aggressively done outreach to those seniors. And how many seniors have we determined that? I'd have to get you that number. Cohort is. Yeah, I don't um, know. What are the identified barriers for seniors to not sign up for SNAP if they are eligible for SNAP? What's, what are, are, have we identified what, what the hurdles are? I, I cannot sit here and say that I know all the hurdles. We know that one of the hurdles is a digital divide, which is why we are very excited to move a large portion of our caseload 
to an online portal, freeing up a lot of our eligibility specialists at centers to assist seniors. Mm -hmm. So we are trying to have a multi-pronged approach, knowing that there is a digital divide among seniors. The other barriers, I, I, we probably have to do a little bit more research on that. Uh, I would just add uh, two things to the uh, barriers. One is the stigma that's often yeah. attached with receiving mm -hmm. this benefit, that it's seen as a handout, mm -hmm. um, and it is quite real amongst this population. And the other is mobility. Mm -hmm. yeah. How about uh, the, uh, the value of the SNAP benefit? Is that seen as something that's you know not worth the trouble? We have seen that as a barrier among our underemployed uh, mm -hmm. population, where it's like the application is just not worth it. Uh, but the reality is that because it is a federal benefit, there's very little that we could do at the city level other than advocate, which we are happy to do in partnership with the city council to, cha to change benefit levels. Um, do, uh, I, is it, do other states supplement SNAP for seniors? Do you know of anything like that happening elsewhere in the country? I'm currently not aware of such a program in another state. Okay. Um, I've heard that I think some other states might do that, okay. um, particularly for senior populations. Um, can you speak to the overall success rate of, of the, um, the overall success rate of SNAP research, <coughs> recertification? The, what we do know is that since implementing uh, some of the modernization tools that we are talking about, we have seen a, less of a churn. So people are recertifying and not having to come back and reapply because they missed a date or they missed a notice or because they couldn't, they were waiting four hours uh, for a call from us as they have in the past. So we have seen uh, folks that are recertifying with less barriers than they did before. Um, do we have, a, do we have a, a, a numerical percentage of the success rate? We can get that back. We can get back to you on that. Okay. Do you have a Do you have a target? Do you think you have a maximum that you think you could have it go to, with the right uh, processes in place? Well, the, right I, the, the place? goal and the federal obligation is that everyone that's eligible recertifies on time, as long as they have all their documentation, right? Uh, so there's not a goal. the The, the requirement <laughs> is that as long as we have everyone's information. And they uh, they have we have a 30 day window to res to have people recertify right that is the federal goal. Um, the barriers. So the goal is 100 percent. The goal is always 100 percent with federal requirements. Yes. Um, what t what additional tools do you think um, could I mean do you think that 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 the current tools that are in place are sufficient to get those recertifications to their maximum or to that 100%. So if you gotta get to 100%, then what's, wh right. how, do you, how do you go about and doing that? And that 100% is, is a moving target, right? Mm -hmm. We do have folks that because the economy is better, they are no longer eligible. So our 100% is to ensure that we are looking at every application or every recertification in the federal requirement line. It doesn't mean that you're actually gonna get SNAP, right? There are a portion of people that may fall off because they're oh, no longer they, eligible. That's okay. Right? Um, the, what we do know is that some of the fixes that we have put in, like the mobile app, right, which means you can take a picture of your document, you can upload it to Access HRA, mm -hmm. and give us an opportunity to look at it without having you come into the office, have made things better. Um, but again, it's a, it's, a, it's a process, and we're learning from that process. And as we identify other barriers, we're having conversations with our state partners uh, to figure out ways that we can remove those barriers. Do you compare New York City's recertification success rate to other districts in, around the state? I, the state does provide us with that information, yes. Okay, so that's, a, that's OTDA provides okay. that to you. Can you provide that to us? We, we can take a note of that. <coughs> um, are you able to characterize that comparison at this point? Not at this point, I'm sorry. Okay. 
Um, maybe if we could have that as a, a, a follow-up to this hearing or, you know, certainly by the time that we have our budget hearing in, uh, in late March. Sure. We, we will look into what it would take to get you back. Okay. Um, uh, we've heard some issues around info line and uh, people having long wait times or getting busy signals. Mm -hmm. um, what, how does HRA maintain the data around capacity and the extent to which uh, it is over capacity right now sure. and, and by how much and mm -hmm. how does that, is that a relationship that you have with do it as an agency or how is that? Uh, how is that situation being examined? Sure. And addressed? So, Infoline is the call center uh, for DSS, so mm -hmm. both for HRA and DHS. Mm -hmm. uh, we do keep very tight uh, numbers on service levels, wait time, abandonment rate. So, we do have that information. Um, I am. We are aware of the wait times. We've heard from our constituents and providers about the wait time. And how long is the average wait time? Uh, I'm not sure about the average wait time at InfoLine. I would have to look into that. Um, if I were to call InfoLine right now, would I get a busy signal? You would go probably be moved into our, our IVRS system, which will give you a lion's share of information that you need. It is in all the local law languages, um, and if you needed to talk to uh, uh, an operator, that's mm -hmm. when your wait time would, would start to get measured. Okay. Would you get one right now? It is a Tuesday at 3 o'clock. We're a little bit better on Tuesdays at three o'clock. Uh -huh. Better than at better than Monday at nine o'clock. Uh -huh. All right, so it does. It's the ebbs and flows of when people call us. Um, so what I am happy to report. Actually, what I would be yeah. interested in seeing is an av you know, that that on a line graph, basically, of what your what what throughout the course of the week, what your average wait time looks like. Sure, but to answer your larger question, uh, mm -hmm. we are in the middle of be being approved for a capital campaign to improve our technology. And we're also in the middle of figuring out how to add staff, so we are responding to. So the capital campaign is that is that a is that a part of the preliminary budget in your capital, or is that how does that capital campaign? We're in, funded? The, we're in conversations with OMB, too. So it's to not in the, the prelim. Budget. It's not in the prelim. Hopefully, in the exact is that. That's is that correct. Right? Um, and that will be a, a build out of of your the info line capacity. I'm, I'm not going to pretend to understand the back end of RT capacity, uh, mm -hmm. but that is the the um, the goal. And is that something that's done by Do It, or is that an HRA? It's done in partnership with Do It. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I think that we're gonna really like to see some um, robust um, uh, report reporting and data on on um, wait times. Abandon call abandonment, um, you know, busy signal uh -huh. uh, responses, uh -huh. all of that stuff. If there's, I mean, I, I appreciate that you might not have it today. Um, we'd love to honestly to see whatever you have uh, with regard to um, to that overall situation. Sure. I'm going to turn over to. Councilmember Prudentic for a follow-up question, and then I have a couple more. To uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to uh, uh, add my voice to those who have um, uh, added praise for the uh, Plentiful app, which uh, is helping. In fact, I had a meeting this morning uh, with a provider before I came here, the Samuel Field Y, and uh, they, they also run the Central Queens Y, and um, I've also had discussions with Met Council. It's not only... Uh, uh, cutting down on food waste because you get a bag of food and you you know some people don't like peanut butter some people are allergic to peanut butter you know but um, but when you're able to order it also provides a level of dignity for people that unfortunately is sorely lacking at many times where people are forced to wait online so they're able to order it and pick it up um, and that really uh, is groundbreaking and so I'm, well it's not your program I just have to be honest, it's not quite how our app wor works, well, because because Met Council, I think, is using something that United Way is developing, 
Well, we yes, that is the that is another take, goal. You know, I learned from my old boss, Nettie Meyerson. When somebody offers you credit, you take it and you smile. I know, <laughs> I know, but, but I just don't but want to confuse But that's okay. I appreciate your here. honesty very I think, much. I think United Way should get and Med Council should get some credit for what they've done. I think it's is it UJA? I think it's UJA, but yeah, um, that's right. It's their it's one of their 100 year projects. It's a great idea, and it really um, and it's modeled after a couple other pantries. And it's cut that. down on waste um, and expense because and it, and that means that our dollars go our dollars our tax dollars go further and um, yeah. to me it's in, in keeping with a you know a tradition of just making sure people have as much dignity as possible I, I will I will take credit for the fact take it. that the new pantries that we're expanding or, or creating are all choice pantries so that does mean that people choose what they want to take and not get a bag just handed to them so same idea different technology thank you very much mr. chairman uh, thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Councilmember Kredenchik. I'm sorry. So, just following up on the on the RFP conversation. So, mm -hmm. I just my staff, the committee staff, just supplied us with information that the bid was actually due on January 4, 2018. Um, bid. This is from from HRA. Uh, this is language from HRA. Bid was for is for emergency food warehousing and delivery for EFAP. Came out in November. Um, HRA is looking for a contract to store and deliver 15 million pounds of food for EFAP program. Uh, the contractor will perform substantial part of EFAP operation. So, so I think that that we had to do the bid over again. I think at some point last year. So if that's the final information, then I guess that is what Echo has out on the on the site at this point. Okay. But bids are all in then. Is that correct? So now. Actually, I, Echo would have to confirm that. We'll go back and, yeah. and discuss it with our colleagues. Okay, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about uh, I might talk about this offline, uh, <coughs> um, um, but we had heard something about this uh, process uh, that I'd like to speak with you about. Absolutely, that, that, may, that might be appropriate for this forum. Um, in terms of sorry, a couple more subjects, okay. and then and then I'm gonna uh, let you guys go. Uh, On-demand technology, um, uh, how, what has been the, uh, what's been the response from clients? How, how have you been able to um, collect feedback from clients on um, this? Is there a mechanism to do that? We have, I don't believe we've done an official survey on the response from clients. Uh, what we do know is that it, it really puts the control back in the client's hands. Uh, for recertification on demand, uh, it, ha it is now across the city. Um, we have, uh, in 2015, we had an average of 85% from May through October that used the on-demand system for recertification. Uh, so we know that it is popular. Uh, mm -hmm. and it sorry, can you, I'm sorry, can you repeat that number? 85% uh, of our research from okay. uh, May to December went okay. through, through that system. Okay. For on-demand application, uh, we have, we are, we've started with Brooklyn. So Brooklyn is now on demand application, which means that you can apply on Access HRA and you can call for your interview. And so that's in addition to doing it through, through uh, Access HRA or that's, so if 85% are doing it through on-demand, then they're not doing it through Access HRA, right? Uh, actually, 85% was before we started on-demand. It went up to 92% once we started recertifications on-demand. Okay. So 92% of SNAP clients are doing their research on-demand. Mm -hmm. And 93% is the current number. So then what percentage are doing it through Access HRA? Well, it's it's two separate uh, pieces, right? Okay, this so is the interview, and that's yes, the that paperwork. Is the is that right? So the paperwork is through Access HRA. The two interview step process. is on demand calling. Yeah, Got it, it is a two step process. Okay. Um, and like I said, we're now moving to on demand application. Same thing. You could still apply through Access HRA and call for your interview uh, mm -hmm. to our on demand hotline. How are how are you communicating with clients that this is? that this is available to them? Every client is being notified if they're already our client. So for example, everyone, How are they being notified? Uh, through the mail and mobile calls. Well, for the applications. Right, so for the applications, it's hard to know who's going to apply. Uh, so that is information that we will have at our centers, uh, for example. But okay. for recertification, it's through uh, direct mailing. Okay. Um, 
One question about Active HRA that you, you had mentioned there's, you said a million unique users have signed up, is that right? Or I believe that's right, yeah. And that reflects how many households? Is it one, one per household or is that? I'd have to go back and see um, how many households that were. That um, you said there were more than a million ac Access HRA mm -hmm. accounts for SNAP households as of December. And you received 24,000 online applications. Mm -hmm. So that means, so if the overall SNAP universe, SNAP, the universe of NYC SNAP recipients is 1.6 6 million, so over 50% have actually signed up for an, uh, for an access and So what I want to make sure is that the data point that we are describing is, is comparable, right? So mm -hmm. it's 1.6 individuals. Mm -hmm. The 1 million, I'd have to go back and see. And remember, we could, you could also have a cash case on Access HRA. Yeah, but you, sorry, right? your testimony said that 1, 1 million Access HRA online accounts for SNAP households. So, so ac uh, cash clients also could, could also could receive SNAP. SNAP. Right. So I want to make sure that, they are, that we are um, that those numbers reflect just SNAP clients or SNAP clients that also receive cash. Right, I mean, it's, it's yeah. all, honestly, I think for my purposes, it's also that they could be counted as well. Sure. If you're receiving both benefits, yeah. that's, that's okay as well. There's a greater, there's, there's fewer cash assistance recipients not accessing SNAP than the other way around. SNAP, if you, sure. right? yes. most cash, if you're able to qualify for cash, you're you most likely able to apply for SNAP. Absolutely. Right. Um, and you should be getting it, obviously. Right? There's no reason in the world why somebody should have a, a cash case and not receive SNAP. That I could think of. Immigration status. Sorry? Immigration status. Would Immigration be status. status. So I see that you're puzzled. I will explain that. Um, so, for example, you could be on safety net. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on your immigration status, mm -hmm. right? But mm -hmm. not necessarily on SNAP, which is a federal benefit. Federal benefit, benefit. got it. Okay. So not um, so safety net, um, not uh, TANF. Right. Correct. Um, okay. Right. So I'm being whispered to him. That's okay. Uh, so one of the other issues on Access HR that we're trying to also fine tune is we can't stop people from starting having multiple accounts. Mm -hmm. So it's not a, a, a very good comparison to... They forgot their the password. They forgot their password, right. yeah. I know, it's the worst. Yeah, I know. It's like banking. It's terrible. Yeah. Um, okay. Write it down somewhere. <laughs> Safe. Um, any of my colleagues have any additional questions? Something added? <laughs> okay, last question. This is, this is an easy one. Um, uh, what is the agency's position on the Trump administration's budget proposal with respect to the use of bo food boxes? I was wondering that was going to come yeah. up. Um, obviously, we are, I mean, I think personally our colleagues and I were having a discussion about this and uh, the fact that people who are, many of them employed, many of them low income, are not respected enough to have their own choice is pretty disgusting. Yeah. Um, so we are troubled by uh, this recent news from Washington, for sure, and it just increases the list of things that we have to work together to combat mm -hmm. on behalf of low-income New Yorkers. So the official position of this administration is that you are opposed to this budget proposal? Absolutely. Okay. Unequivocally? Unequivocally. Okay. Thank you. So are we. Um, okay. Um, with that, I want to thank you very much for your thank time you. and your patience for answering our questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you. So we're going to take a one-minute break, uh, and when we return, we'll uh, have Joel Berg from Hunger Free America, Rachel Sabella from the Food Bank, from Susan Welber from the Legal Aid Society, and Danny Stewart from Safe Horizon.
Three bucks for a Charlie Brown hot sauce mix. Let me see if you got something about it. Then the first is Soviet. Okay. Welcome back. Um, uh, welcome to this panel. Whoever wants to begin, uh, feel free to go ahead. Um, I think you should start we're with we're okay. doing three minutes, okay. give or take. Okay. I'll take. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm Joel Berg, CEO of Hunger Free America. Thank you for the council having this hearing. Today is Thursday, if you're watching Fox for those. Uh, I, I want to commend the administration's testimony, particularly their focus on housing costs. The more work I do on this, the more I'm convinced that lack of food is just a symptom and it's the broader affordability. Uh, you know, crisis, so the council can, you know, triple EFAP as it should as much as possible, but as long as housing costs are through the roof and child care costs are through the roof, we're going to be on a treadmill going in reverse. Uh, rather than, you know, repeat my voluminous uh, written testimony, I'll just hit on a, a few points. I do re want to respond to the issue about ICE enforcement uh, that uh, Councilwoman Adams raised. Uh, right now, under federal law, uh, they cannot uh, hold uh, against an immigrant family getting SNAP or other benefits. But just to be clear, there was a recent news report in a very reputable uh, entity, Reuters, that the Trump administration is considering a proposal that would basically restrict immigration access to legal immigrants based on receiving SNAP or Medicaid. And that would be an unconscionable attack against the Statue of Liberty and our history of immigration. And considering my mother came here two months old and my family would have been wiped out uh, if we weren't allowed in. I'm one immigrant son who doesn't forget our history and I hope none of us do, including the Drumpf family. Uh, a few other points about our, our recommendations. Uh, obviously, the administration uh, should uh, you know, fully fund in its executive budget both EFAP and, and SNAP outreach. I stood with the then, uh, then uh, General Welfare Committee Chair, Mr. de Blasio, and then Public Advocate de Blasio many times, uh, lasting preliminary budgets that did not include this funding. This is, as they say, a no-brainer. Uh, uh, two, the city should, even though it's limited which students can get SNAP, it really should work with CUNY to ensure that it's equal, equitably distributing work-study funds and if it means using some city funds to pick up the gap and so more students get less in work-study, just if you get one hour of work-study, that means you're at least work eligible for S SNAP. And so I think the lot the city can do to do that through CUNY and then make students aware of that. And so that does trigger SNAP eligibility. Frankly, we support pantries on campus, but increasing SNAP uh, participation is a much better way to go in, in the long term. Uh, obviously, uh, HRA has been doing a great job on increasing uh, access to a number of programs with the technology. We'd urge them to accelerate that. And as you know, Councilman Kalos has been pushing this for a number of years. We strongly support efforts to combine access with non HRA programs such as Section 8, such as, as, as WIC. The city is already ahead of the rest of the country on this, but I've written extensively about that and can provide more details on how to do that. Obviously, the mayor should accelerate the efforts to bring in-classroom breakfast to every classroom in the city, including high schools and middle schools. Uh, we should support the state state legislature's attempt and the governor's attempt to uh, mandate breakfast in the classroom, and lastly, uh, oppose with every fiber our being and then some fibers not in our being, the outrageous Trump administration's attempts not only to cut $200 billion, but to take away food choice. They are against government intervening in the personal lives of corporations who want to pollute, but when it comes to low-income people, not only do they want government on their tops, they want them on their bottoms, their backs, and their fronts, and only Trump administration could take $200 billion away from low-income people and somehow manage to increase federal bureaucracy. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Three minutes and change. Yeah. Um, <laughs> by the way, if we, uh, it would be great to see if you can get uh, Mr. de Blasio to stand with you again at this executive budget. Uh, he yeah. has an open invitation. I am going to the state of the city tonight. I will not heckle, but uh, should I see him? Uh, I'll let you I'm work your magic. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. always hard to go after Joel. I will not be as comical, um, but I will say we are as adamant in our battle against hunger. My name is Rachel Sabella. I'm the Director of Government Relations and Policy at Food Bank for New York City. Food Bank is the city's largest major hunger relief organization. This year we celebrate our 35th anniversary, and from the start of our organization, we have partnered with the City of New York. We are grateful for the partnership with HRA. We are grateful for the partnership with the Council. We look forward to continuing that. Um, 
Um, I know I'm going to be very brief today. You have my very long written testimony along with policy priorities and our updated meal gap map with City Council District information. So really excited, very much looking forward to meeting with new members of the Council and to continue working with our two champions here today. Um, I also want to say we are really thrilled that there are so many members of our network in the room today that are going to testify. And I'm excited for you to hear firsthand from these dedicated emergency food providers about what they're seeing in terms of hunger. Um, I just want to respond to two quick things from the testimony earlier. One about Food Help NYC. It's a tremendous resource. Um, one of the things we think there is growth for is for now that it has EFAP pantries. So if there are other pantries in the city, a really great opportunity to put other ones on there so people have access to that information. And two, I've talked with some of you about this, but the Hunger Prevention Nutrition Assistance Program, HIPNAP is what was referred to during um, the earlier testimony as well. Um, there was an RFP related to that funding. Um, New York City was awarded 44% of that funding, which is historically lower than where it's been. So happy to continue offline conversations about that. Just want to be mindful of the topic at hand. Um, the two quick things that I want to talk about is one, we are all in agreement that the White House pro budget proposal is absolutely dangerous. Information is continuing to come in, but what we do know that the structural changes would slash funding by $213 billion over 10 years. Years. Those cuts mean a loss of 40 billion meals over 10 years. And I'm reading that because that information is literally coming in as we're talking. When we see what that numbers mean, when we see with New York City's meal gap of 225 million, we put that on top. We want to be united as a city, as with the council, with the de Blasio administration, with all of the anti-hunger providers in fighting that. I also want to, this is not a budget hearing, and I am very much looking forward to the general welfare budget hearing hearing in March, but I want to do share our deep concern over the proposal as the preliminary budget does have a minus number with funding. The EFAP baseline food funding is now listed at 8.2 million, um, and which reduces it by 7.3 million. That reduces meals in the city by 6.8 million meals. That's a huge amount, and we stand to work with the council. We are excited about um, the passion and commitment from the speaker. He's going to be addressing our conference on Thursday um, and really thrilled to work with all of you. So thank you for your continued support. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Councilmember Grinedrick for a moment for, to make a statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you all for being here today. Um, I, I do have to go. I actually am a chairman now, so. Um, so excited. <laughs> but glad you're still here with us. Um, well, I'm delighted to be here, especially uh, with Steve. Uh, he's done such a wonderful job. Um, and this issue, as you know, uh, is very near and dear to my heart. So I want to thank you for being here today, all of you that are here, um, you know, feeding people. Uh, there's nothing more important. I learned that lesson from my parents, and, you know, people would come to my house. I say, you have to take something. My mother will consider her day ruined if she can't feed you. So um, I want to thank you all. Um, it's, it's not really a joking matter. We, we joke about it just to keep the levity at times. But the fact that anybody's going hungry in this great city is really uh, to the detriment of every single New Yorker. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'm going to take leave uh, of you. And I know, uh, hope, hopefully, I'll get back here uh, before the hearing is over. But if not, thank you all for the work that you do. Um, it is critically important in the lives of millions of people who you're never going to know. But you are affecting people's lives in the most positive way. So with that, I thank you. And I look forward to continuing to work with you on this budget and the years ahead. Thank you, Councilmember Grinnell. You're, you're always here in spirit. We always feel your presence. Whoever wants to uh, continue. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for your time today and this afternoon. My name is Danny Stewart. I'm Director of Operations and Finance for Safe Horizon Street Work Project. Um, I'm here today to provide testimony to the impact of our food and nutritional services program of street work. Street work is a program from home for homeless youth and young adults up to the age of 25. We have two drop-in centers, one in Harlem, one in Lower East Side. Both are soup kitchens as well as a pan community pantry program. We have a late night community outreach program that goes throughout New York City every night of the week. As and we also have a crisis shelter for runaway homeless youth, a 24 bed facility in Harlem. So. I, we're one of the programs that w did not receive renewed funding with HIPNAP, the Hunger P 
prevention and nutritional assistance program with the state. The, this loss of the funding, which is $150,000, has dramatic impact on our program. So as you can imagine, homeless youth, one of the basic needs is food, right? Coming in hungry, everything else goes out the window if you cannot meet the basic need. So food insecurity is a real, real issue, but it's more than just about that. It's more than just providing a meal. It's how we do it. So the meal that we provide, it communicates our respect, their dignity, and what we value in them. And a novel concept of love. So we lovingly provide food to them and take into consideration what they want in, in the meal. So it's not just providing the meal, it's our engagement into their lives and how we can connect them to other services that we provide. Last year, we provided 35,000 hot meals and 25,000 food pantry meals uh, through our drop-in centers. And um, the meals that we provide is one, of the, is one of the cornerstones of our program. If you think about uh, it, your own home, when you walk in and you smell a meal being prepared, you feel welcome. We firmly believe every person should have a place to belong and feel like that they belong to. The meal says that, that they're welcome into our home, <coughs> and, and we do that um, because they deserve that. So we graciously request your support in helping to support our meals program of $150,000. So thank you very much for your consideration. Good afternoon. I'm Susan Welber. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society, um, which is a large legal services provider here in the city. We have offices in every borough. Um, I want to thank uh, Chairperson Levin and the rest of your committee and staff for holding this hearing and for um, giving us a forum to speak. Um, as you know, probably through work with the Legal Aid Society, we really like to get into the nitty gritty of what HRA is doing. And so we had, in terms of that nitty gritty, we had three recommendations that we wanted to present to you that are outlined in our testimony, but that I'll repeat. Um, the first one is for the city council and your committee to, to play a role even beyond what you're doing at this hearing today in helping to improve communications between HRA and your constituents. Um, we think that uh, there is room for improvement. There's a lot of technology that you heard about from the agency, um, but it doesn't always work. When it works, it's great, but when it doesn't work, people are left with really um, little guidance as to how to address their basic needs, and particularly with the SNAP program, that results in hunger, hunger that's avoidable because people are eligible. So there are four areas in which communications could be improved. One is with respect to applications and recertifications, which you heard quite a bit about. Um, we hear that the on-demand technology doesn't always work. A lot of people, as you heard, aren't signed up for Access NYC. Um, there are a lot of people who are SNAP only, who receive SSI because of severe disabilities, who have a hard time using the technology, and they need the ability to communicate with the agency with live people, not through an IVRS on the info line that takes 20 minutes to get through, but to be able to call a caseworker and to, to speak to someone live. Um, same for the recertifications, and you know, I think it would be great if you could follow up with the agency and get a better sense of beyond this 100% goal, where are they in terms of um, having people recertify and the outcomes of those recertifications, and how many are abandoned. Um, what we hear is that people have to reapply and re-recertify, and they ultimately get accepted, which indicates that those repeats were avoidable in the first place. Um, there's also a difficulty in communicating in the context of required client reporting. So with the ABOD, you heard uh, Administrator Bonilla say that 2,800 people had their, ca their, their benefits cut because they didn't fulfill the ABOD requirements. Um, 
that coupled with the fact that there's an acknowledged problem with the info line and that people can't get through, how many of the people who got their, their benefits cut in the ABOD were people who couldn't get through the info line? Does the agency know that? And is there something they can do about that? Um, and finally, there are affirmative requirement, affirmative needs to communicate with the agency in the case of emergencies such as lack of food, um, housing emergencies, and various other emergencies. So uh, we'd like that. That's our primary recommendation to the city council to get even more involved in this. Perhaps have another oversight hearing that's really drilling down on the, these issues. The other two recommendations, one is, and I think the Administrator Bonilla recognized this, that all the benefits complement one, one another and so that ongoing problems with cash assistance affect hunger because many of our clients who receive both cash assistance and SNAP need to dip into their cash assistance to, to uh, bridge the gap that they, they have for food. Um, we've outlined some ongoing problems that the agency continues to to encounter despite lots of improvements um, and we hope that there could be even more improvement in those areas. And then finally we think that the agency needs to, we're, we're concerned about the preparation for changes in the public charge rules that could be coming down the pike rather, um, you know, in the next six months or so and, you know, we, we think the city council can play a role. We know that you passed uh, an amendment to the charter that requires a, um, a convening of agency heads. We don't know that, that that group has actually convened, and we hope that you can push the city agencies to get together and figure out how to prepare for this. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony, and, and I, I would certainly, obviously, uh, be examining all of your testimony in full, the written testimony to, to um, make sure that we're being responsive, particularly in the budget season, to recommendations that may require a budget uh, allocation, but then uh, obviously a lot of the um, operational uh, issues. And I think you're right, we should be maybe looking to do an oversight hearing to really drill down on these operational aspects of uh, HRI client services. Um, and so, yes, I want to just all thank you. I, I, one thing just in regard to that, to your testimony, I think you made reference to this, and, and uh, Councilmember Lander made reference to it uh, earlier. That yes, it is. It's it's almost un unrecognizable from where we were four and a half years ago um, in terms of the orientation of, of the agency towards these benefits that they're uh, um, you know uh, entrusted with um, uh, providing to people. But um, but that doesn't mean uh, that there is not uh, uh, need for improvement. Um, you know, need for uh, you know, uh, candid self-examination on, on, you know, on the part of the agency to, to really be clear as to what's working, what's not working, and if it's not working, how do we make it better? Um, you know, I certainly feel uh, an urgency um, being that um, I will be out of office in, you know, three years and 11 months, and so I, 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 we need to do everything that, you know, from, I need to make sure we do everything I, I can over the next couple of years. So certainly uh, need that collaboration with you all to make sure that that is um, that we're do making every stride that we can, leaving no stone unturned. So, thank you. Uh, next, um, next panel: Alexander Rappaport from Mesbia uh, Soup Kitchen Network. Also from Masbia, Ruben Diaz, Masbia of Queens, Aaron Cyperstein from Met Council on Jewish Poverty, and Melissa Olson, Community Health Care Network. Okay, I'll start. 
Uh, thank you, Chairperson Levin and members of the general of the Committee on General Welfare for the opportunity to speak this afternoon. My name is Melissa Olson. I'm the Director of Nutrition at Community Healthcare Network, or CHN. Uh, we're a nonprofit okay. network of 13 federally qualified health centers, including two school-based health centers and a fleet of medical mobile vans. And we provide affordable primary care, dental, behavioral health, and social services to 85,000 New Yorkers annually in Manhattan, Queens, Brooklyn, and the Bronx. Uh, as has been stated many times, 1.25 million New Yorkers experienced food insecurity. And this issue especially impacts low-income communities, especially where our clinics are. Um, nearly 65% of CHN patients live at or below the federal poverty line. And many reside in communities with limited access to full-scale grocery stores. Many of the neighborhoods our clinics serve possess some of the highest rates of meal gaps per person, particularly East New York, Washington Heights, Harlem, and the South Bronx. Our patients tell us that cost, distance, and convenience are some of the biggest barriers to food security. CHN has taken on a variety of initiatives to address hunger in these communities. For over eight years, our nutrition team has participated in the Health Bucks program, and we use this program as an opportunity to tell our patients that they are eligible to use their EBT card at any farmer's market in the, in the city and receive increased purchasing power to buy fresh produce. We also host educational walks to nearby farmer's markets to show patients how easy it is to use the program. But one barrier to utilization is limited patient time. Some patients tell us they can't take time out of their schedule to travel to farmer's markets on scheduled market days. In response to the location and time challenge, we partnered with Corbin Hill Food Project to implement a weekly vegetable box program at our clinics in Crown Heights and Williamsburg. In contrast to the traditional farm share model, which involves a significant financial commitment up front, our vegetable box program allows patients and community members to purchase fresh, local, and in-season produce on a weekly basis, accepts EBT cards as a form of payment. Um, our weekly vegetable box costs $15 and participants can decide to opt in or opt out each week depending on if they have enough funds. Even better this year, Corbin Hill received a grant to subsidize the cost of the program, reducing the cost to $10 per box now. This program has been popular with our Brooklyn patients. We have about 125 participants that rotate in and out weekly, averaging 10 to 25 boxes per site each week, and we're hearing very positive feedback from the participants. Um, so we have uh, expanded the program to our Long Island City Health Center this year as well. Our nutritionists also conduct outreach at local food pantries, educating community members about healthy eating and referring them to our nutritional program. And we refer low-income patients to our social work team to help sign up for SNAP benefits. But many of our patients frequently run out of benefits by the end of the month, as you've been hearing, and that prevents them from having consistent access to food. Uh, nearly 60% of, of SNAP recipients use their benefits within the first week of issuance, leaving many participants struggling to eat by the end of the month. We've also observed that patients who are undocumented frequently um, experience food insecurity as their immigration status generally makes them ineligible for SNAP benefits. We're seeking new ways to address these challenges, and we would look forward to partnering with the Council to ident identify additional solutions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Chair, very much. We're very happy at Met Council that you're chairing this uh, general welfare, and we're also very happy that you have as one of your committee members, uh, Barry Gudenchik. Barry Gudenchik is actually a person who I went personally on many weeks before the Sabbath and give out food with an organization called Tom Shabbos, which is a, uh, an organization that gets from EFAP and gets from Met Council. So to have people on committee members that actually gave food out and to see empty pantries in their home and to see the homes where they live is a passionate committee and I'm sure that the job will get done and I saw from the questions that you gave HRA, it's getting there. My name is Aaron Sipperstein. I'm the Director of External Affairs for Met Council and a little bit what Met Council did in FY17. Just in FY17, we aided 205,000 New Yorkers in their fight against poverty and hunger. We provided more than 7 million meals through emergency food. We aided more than 10,000 households with SNAP benefits. And we distributed more than $500,000 in food distribution cards. Those are actual cards, a dignified way of people to go into a store, a regular store. They're not waiting on lines. And they're able to get the food that they need before the holidays and even before Sabbath. It's very dignified. 
We know we already heard that there's 1.3 million people who are food insecure in New York. 300,000 people live in poor and near poor Jewish households that observe kosher dietary laws. For many of our clients, the high cost of kosher food prevents a unique presents a unique challenge. While statewide, most families run out of SNAP benefits by the third week each month, a family that keeps kosher runs out by the second week. We've heard about the third, now it's the second week because of the amount of money that it costs to buy kosher and halal food. To be successful in our fight against hunger, we rely on a strong emergency food system, and we ask that the city council support a fortified EFAP through a baseline increase in funding to $22 million for FY18. We also ask that the city council support a policy of cost-neutral preferencing of kosher and halal products within the EFAP system, ensuring that clients with religious dietary restrictions have equitable access to emergency food. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for having us. Uh, my name is Ruben Diaz. I am the chef of Mas Vias of Kitchen. I've been working with Mas Vias uh, 11 years ago in different positions. Right now, I'm in Mas Vias of Queens. And for my part, and I'm being in the kitchen and food pantry working directly with people, with the customers. Mm, before we had some trouble cooking all the fresh vegetables because all the food that we provide is fresh. We cook everything at the same day. Also to complete the, the, the food pantry package because as you know, the, the, the my plate chart is a big number of points. But the last six months, we got <coughs> thousands of pounds of tilapia and a lot of frozen meals, a lot of frozen f uh, vegetables that help us to finish all the cooked in the kitchen because mm, our workforce is volunteers. Sometimes we don't have it. Sometimes we don't have time to peel all the carrots, to <laughs> peel all the potatoes. But with the huge help, it's been easy for us. And also to complete the pantry, to complete all the pounds for, for the customers. And that will be uh, a quick breed for us and huge help. Thank you. Thank you, Council uh, Chair, for, for having us and for having this meeting, this important meeting. Um, just a shout out to Laura, is also with our staff over there. Um, and um, so, I'll, um, as, the, as Chef Rube, I'm Alexander Rappaport with the Masbia Soup Kitchen Network. We have three soup kitchens around the city one in Borough Park, one in Flatbush, and one in Forest Hills. Um, I'll, I'll try to explain a little bit, um, uh, elaborate a little bit more of uh, how the what Chef Ruben was talking about connects to what we were hearing from the people who were sitting here before. So we did see a very positive increase. It's, it's good to, as an organization, to always ask for more, ask for more, but we also need to celebrate what we did achieve. I think th the past six months, we saw a huge increase in food coming from EFAP. Um, and what Chef Ruben was talking about was a lot of the frozen food. It happened to be kosher. Um, one of the items that are, so to speak, cost neutral as kosher is tilapia fish. The chicken EFAP has, it's going to be hard to get kosher for a good price, so to speak, but t t frozen tilapia was something that we had. Things like that was a huge help. Um, we also, um, two of our kitchens are part of the collaborative, so we, um, the New York City Food Collaborative, and we did through them see a huge increase in we got equipment to be able to increase capacity. So we're here today to kind of um, celebrate what we have done last year and try to hold it and even grow it for this year. We, we definitely did see uh, in every level in our, cap in, in our distribution, week by week, we were able to meet goals. In, I remember two years ago, there was a New York one at our place all day because we had empty shelves. It was so bad in the winter where now with the increase of EFAP, um, the, this is the the food is available. It's there. Yes, we could fix a little bit more abilities of kosher or the ordering that Councilmember Bradlander was speaking about. Still an issue, but I believe they're all working on it. So I'm here today to celebrate EFAP and hold what we did last year, so we could do it this year again. 
thank you. Uh, I mean, just to, to this panel, uh, obviously the work that you guys do uh, every single day is is the essential the essential component. Um, you know, without uh, this uh, incredible network um, of many volunteer based organizations or um, small CBOs, um, you know, we really, you know, many, 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 many New Yorkers um, would uh, be cut off from um, the services that even despite the best of intentions would not get to them. So um, we, we need you, uh, we need you to be, uh, you know, solvent. We need you to be able to pay your bills and pay your lights, to be able to pay your staff. Um, we need you uh, uh, to have, we need to be able to get your feedback as we're uh, going through the budget process and, and, and um, you know, even, you know, we're going to have rallies and everything to, to, to uh, baseline and restore the EFAP funding, but uh, I, I almost, you know, am nervous to do that because I don't want to take you away from the good work that you're doing in the communities every day. Um, so uh, thank you for that. I look forward to continuing to work with you. Uh, let's get this uh, EFAP uh, baseline, uh, as Aaron said, all 22 million. Let's get it all baseline. Let's do the whole thing. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, make sure that we're not uh, going through this ridiculous budget dance. Um, again, this is the last remaining vestige of budget dancedom uh, that uh, we have uh, really banished to the, the dustbins of history for the most part, and uh, this seems to be the last one, and it's, that, that's wrong. So let's, let's continue to work together. Thank you. Next panel, Danette Rivera from... Uh, is it JITA Community Outreach Center? Annette Jackson from Action Food Board. Daniel Reyes, New York Common Pantry. And Ariel Saransky from UJ Federation. Saransky. Good afternoon, my name is Ariel Sabransky. I'm representing UJ Federation of New York. Um, thank you for holding this hearing. Chairperson Levin and uh, other members of the committee that were there, we really appreciated their thoughtful questions. Um, so you have a copy of my written testimony and a lot of it echoes what my colleagues discussed. Um, my colleagues have already mentioned some of what is mentioned, so I'm just gonna echo my support for increased funding for EFAP as well as continuing to invest in expanding access to SNAP, as HRA spoke about some of their efforts before. Um, I'd also like to encourage the city to think about ways to increase access to meals, especially co kosher meals, as was discussed on the previous panel. Um, it is essential that the city invest resources in ensuring that food pantries are equipped with enough food to serve their clients, especially culturally competent foods, such as kosher and halal foods. In line with the focus on seniors that HRA discussed, it is imperative that the city invest in the agencies that run congregate or home delivered meal programs. And lastly, um, I'd like to thank Barbara Turk and Barry Grzenchuk who brought up UJA's Digital Choice Food Pantry that we're investing a lot of time and effort in this year for our centennial initiative. And we'd like to urge the city to think creatively about ways to support um, our efforts here. So UJA Federation of New York is ampl amplifying our current anti-poverty efforts and investing in more efficient, effective, and dignified ways to serve the most vulnerable in our community and foster systemic change. Our vision includes creating a digital choice food pantry system on two community resource hubs, one in Brooklyn and the other in Queens. The central focus of the Brooklyn hub is food given the overwhelming poverty in this neighborhood. The Brooklyn and Queens hubs will both offer on-site access to the digital choice food pantry system with food orders delivered from Met Council's nearby warehouse throughout the day. The Brooklyn hub will also feature nutritional counseling and a demo kitchen to teach clients how to prepare healthy meals with the food they receive from the pantry. One of the biggest challenges our food pantries continue to face is the procurement of kosher protein and kosher fresh produce. We urge the City Council and the Administration to think creatively about ways to increase access to kosher protein and produce 
for food pantries so that we can ensure our clients have the nutritious food they need. We also recommend exploring ways to open the city procurement process to those entities operating under kosher supervision so that agencies pur purchasing kosher food can benefit from economies of scale. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Hello, my name is Danette Rivera and I am the Executive Director of Jitter Community Outreach Service Center in Jamaica, Queens. Thank you, Chairman Levin and the General Welfare Committee for spending time today to hear more about how the community-based organizations like my own partner with New York City to address food need in our communities. Jitter provides services to the community including a twice weekly food pantry. We are a member of Food Bank for the New York City and rely on resources including New York City's Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, to help alleviate hunger for the people that come to our door. Each week, I am a witness of this fact firsthand as thousands of my clients, men, women, and children, including seniors, repeatedly find hunger relief at my community center. EFAP is important to our Queens community not only because it provides food, but because by assisting low-income households with these essential items, it helps relieve financial burdens such as housing and other necessities for families in need. Furthermore, the food service EFAP provides to our community center allows us to be a trusted space to offer a variety of resources that reach people at the core of their need. For low-income households, every meal counts. EFAP coincides with, our, with other important programs like SNAP, as well as school meals. I asked one of the people that visits our center to tell me what our program means to her. She wrote me a short letter that I'd like to share with you. Her name is Natasha Valoy, and she is a single mom of two who currently lives in a shelter five blocks away from my community center. This is what she has to say. <coughs> Quote, the EFAP program has helped to put food on my table for my boys and me when I didn't have anything else. There were many days when I didn't know how I was going to feed my kids. But when I walked to the pantry, I found exactly what I need to put warm me a warm meal on our plates. Without the EFAP program, I wouldn't know how to make it work sometimes. If we lost this program, many families, including mine, are going to bed hungry. This program has helped me in so many ways, and that is why it is so important to keep it up and running. So many single mothers and poor families from our communities don't have to worry about how they are going to feed their children when SNAP benefits run out, end quote. For Natasha, EFAP helps her family be hunger free. Thank you for fighting for her and all people served by New York City's anti-hunger program I urge you to fight the good fight and, keep, and make EFAP stronger, knowing that you will not allow hunger to win. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for inviting us to give testimony, okay? My name is Annette Jackson. I am a retired senior citizen after a career in advertising <coughs> and uh, Board of Education. I am a United States citizen. I am a registered voter in New York City and I live in the borough of Manhattan. I am proud to be a Food Action Board member uh, with Hunger Free New York City, formerly known as New York Coalition Against Hungry. I'm sorry, against hunger, okay? This organization advocates on behalf of low-income families in New York. I am also a volunteer with the food pantry at the West Side Campaign Against Hunger on West 86th Street in Manhattan. I've been there for five years. During these years, I've seen thousands of hungry people and families come into the pantry to get food for a week and to eat at our soup kitchens. I have been struggling since 1960 when I came, when I moved from North Carolina to New York City. Today, I'm a widow and still struggle for myself. I know how hard it is to make ends meet. I have been there. 
And this is the reason I volunteer here at the pantry to help others avoid what I've gone through when I was raising my family while working and earning minimum wage. Back then and still today, there are many challenges for the low-income people in New York. Please, please do not cut programming. We need all the vital services to feed the hungry. There are too many families and people living in poverty in shelters and in food and in food security. I see senior citizens, unemployed people, immigrants from many countries, veterans, disabled people, and single mothers with families come into the pantry. They all need to eat and they all need to be fed. If SNAP food stamps, as well as funding for food pantries and soup kitchens are cut or discontinued, it would be devastating for so many people trying to feed their families and children. I believe that the inability to give enough to eat will increase so many other problems in the city because without food, everything becomes harder. Food is a necessity. Senior citizens will be more vulnerable to this problem. I'm here today to tell you we need our SNAP program, okay? Mm -hmm. Food pantries and soup kitchens. I see hundreds of families who survive from this program. I see homeless, immigrants, and low-income New Yorkers from all, from all over the boroughs who are in need, okay? I am a grandmother who knows how important these programs are for low-income families and for anyone who is in need of these great programs in our city. Now, my question to you all, okay? What is going to happen if, this, if these programs are cut for low-income families? How will they eat? This is America, the greatest country in the world. What's gonna happen, okay? Again, please, please don't cut the programs. Thank you very much. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Daniel Reyes. I'm the Deputy Executive Director at the New York Common Pantry. Uh, thank you to the City Council, especially Speaker Corey Johnson and General, General Welfare Chair Steve Levin for giving me the opportunity to speak on behalf of the thousands of families that the New York Common Pantry serves. Last year, we served over six million meals to New Yorkers across the five boroughs out of our locations in East Harlem, Mott Haven, Longwood, and through our mobile teams that travel across the Bronx, Queens, Brooklyn, and Manhattan. At NYCP, our strategy is to alleviate food insecurity through access to healthy food, wellness, nutrition, education, and the acquisition and management of resources like SNAP, health insurance, and rental assistance. We are grateful that the City Council has prioritized anti-hunger anti -hunger programs including three years of increases to the Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, as well as the expansion of universal free lunch in nearly all NYC public schools. At NYCP, we are gravely concerned that even though New York City is facing a meal gap of 225 million meals, the preliminary budget for fiscal year 2019 proposes a cut in EFAP food funding to 8.2 million. EFAP provides a vital supply of nutritious food to soup kitchens and food pantries across the city and to the 1.4 million New Yorkers who rely on the emergency food network to put food on their table. New York Common, New York Common Pantry continues to expand, expand, extend its reach across the city to ensure that no family or individual goes hungry, but we cannot do this alone. Due to the continued scale of need we confront, we are committed to continue our investment to expand services to reduce hunger for all New Yorkers in need. This investment starts with dollars raised from our private supporters that are leveraged with government uh, resources to drive impact. We opened a new choice pantry site in the Bronx in April 2017, increased the capacity and reach of our Help 365 case management program through a New York State award from the Office of Temporary and Disability Assistance in 2016, and increased the capacity and reach of our, uh, excuse me, uh, and increase the visibility and presence of New York Common Pantry throughout New York City from partner sites and mobile programs. This has result, it resulted in a significant rise in meals and resources accessed for our guests over the past three years. Our ability to keep on track will require continued support from the City of New York through EFAP, <coughs> council discretionary dollars, and other funding streams. 
For the families of NYCP and for all New Yorkers, every meal counts, and increasing funding to EFAP is essential to ensure emergency food programs can serve every New Yorker in need. Please prioritize increased funding to EFAP in the fiscal year 2019 New York City budget. It is absolutely vital to our ability to serve all families who turn to us in need of food support. Thank you for your continued support. We look forward to working with you to ensure that no New Yorker goes hungry. Thank you very much, Mr. Reyes. I, so I just, the same uh, that I said to the previous panel, I want to say to you all as well, we absolutely need you and uh, we rely on you uh, as a city um, and you're an essential, your, your organizations are essential, your volunteers are essential, you are essential um, and it is um, the least that this committee can do and that this city government can do uh, to, uh, to match your commitment um, or aspire to match your, match your commitment uh, and, uh, and, and, and we just, uh, you know, honor the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Last panel, Rachel Shero from City Meals on Wheels. George, uh, uh, Jordan Rosenthal from Boom Health and Laura Allen from Masbia. And if anyone else wants to testify, just fill out a slip and you can join this panel. <coughs> Uh, I'll be very quick. Rachel Sherrow, City Meals on Wheels. Um, heard a lot about hungry New Yorkers. I'm hungry myself right now. We've been here for a long time. Um, heard a little bit about older adults who have trouble with mobility, accessing SNAP and other benefits. So I'm here to talk about homebound elders who can't access sometimes benefits if case management, uh, if there's a wait list, which there is currently and there has been for years. Um, in addition to healthy, nutritious food options. Um, so it's an issue. What City Meals does is we supplement with some extra programs, a mobile food pantry, um, because we literally need to bring the food right to their doors. But it's not enough funding, um, and we know that there's a greater need. There's also been a huge increase, not only in the elder population, but in the elder hunger population. And we're talking about people who are literally choosing between rent, medication, and food because they are living on fixed incomes. We don't have to go into the entire Trump budget that could be coming down the pike, but that could be um, absolutely devastating for our population. We're feeding over 18,000 people a day. I know you asked about how many are eligible in the city. We think, we also use sort of Medicaid eligibility. We think there are probably 36,000 people who are um, eligible for Meals on Wheels, so we need to figure out how to feed them, but can't do it if we don't have the money or the system. So. That's my spiel. Thank you again for obviously holding this important hearing. And maybe next time we can have a larger room yes. so more people can be here. Rachel, I just want to ask. Uh, sure. So City Meals on Wheels, your funding is derived from where? 90% is private donations um, from 50,000 New Yorkers and beyond. And we get 10% from the city. Part city council, uh, mostly dipped now because a lot of our council money has, thank goodness, been baselined. Um, but part of our funding does, uh, so for every meal that's funded by City Meals, the federal government sends 67 cents back to DIFTA to reinvest into the program through a cash in lieu of commodities program through Department of Agriculture. We're not sure what's going to happen with that. Mm -hmm. um, if it doesn't, if it does get cut, that's, those are huge dollars and it could mean tens of thousands of fewer meals for folks um, every year. And you have 14,000 clients? 18,400. 18,400 clients every single day? Every single day, five boroughs. And your meals are delivered by? Local meal providers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, yours is in uh, Brooklyn Rise Borough, and mm -hmm. Heights and Hill is your case management agency. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, local CBOs doing this in um, uh, walking routes, vehicles, um, you name it, every day. Mm -hmm. And you have, and I know this, you have, uh, uh, your relationship with your clients are much more than just dropping off a meal. It is absolutely more than a meal. I mean, it's, you know, 
if anybody has the luxury of getting, I don't know, Blue Apron or one of those things, they leave it at your door. Meals on Wheels, there's actually a person delivering the meal, knocking on the door, checking on the person to make sure that the person is okay. And if there has been, if they notice that there has been a decline, then case management is um, notified immediately. Right, which is also an essential component. And we at the city and council list, support the, right. the case management, but obviously. Which was fantastic, but now we're back to a wait list. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so sure, much for the, course. obviously, for the work that you do every thank day. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Laura, and I'm representing Montefiore Soup Kitchen Network. Um, and I was going to discuss uh, the Plentiful app and how beneficial it has been to us. Okay. Um, we're using the Plentiful app, obviously, for the pantry. And before that, I would have to take the forms that had the zip codes and the, you know, just data that we, we collect, but, you know, and enter it into our database, enter it into the system so that we have an idea of, how many households we've served and what they comp uh, what they what their composition was, with the Plentiful app um, as far as the back end, makes my job easier and faster to the point where sometimes people, Alex, thinks I'm not working. Okay, um, scheduling is of course easier. It's better um, to be able to communicate and have an interface that we can let them know about um, when the pantry is, if there's a change, and of course now we can better serve the communities that we're in by adding different pantry dates now. Uh, before that would have just been, we'd have been deluged with paperwork. Um, and so the, the ease of use, that's absolutely great on the back end. Um, my volunteers who are, some, we have them at each location that are in charge of um, doing that part with the Plentiful app, they have also expressed that it is easier for them. Um, what I will say is that as far as the clients, there was, um, there have been sometimes issues of hesitation uh, where they may not want to get the information that we would require for them to register, which is basically name, phone number, household makeup, mm -hmm. and because of the ICE issue, mm -hmm. um, people are afraid when things are electronic about giving their information, um, which ironically I see that we were trying to get on to that with the HRA representatives here, and they kept talking about the portal, and they weren't making that relation that people do not want to give their information mm -hmm. electronically mm -hmm. because of these fears. Mm -hmm. um, but luckily, we do have um, our, our volunteers and other people that speak different languages, and we're usually able to push through that. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody for the, the Plentiful app, and I, I think it's absolutely awesome, and I thank you for having this hearing. It's much needed, and um, I'm glad to be here. Um, just in general, I'm also glad to be here representing Masbia. However, I am sad that I'm not here to be just here as a regular constituent because every single thing that we spoke on today, I have firsthand knowledge of and I would have loved to have testified about it. Can you question about Plentiful? Uh, yeah. how, how long have you been using it? We've been using Plentiful, it is, I believe, almost a year. Okay. It's, it's definitely been quite, it's almost a year. Okay. Um, that we got the training, which was very good. Um, we do have a good custom service as far as if we need um, any help or we have any questions. Okay, and that, that's with the, the food collaborative. It's all through the food collaborative. Uh, the food collaborative and um, yes. And so it would be, it would be beneficial to, to have that expanded to every program that wanted it. I believe so, yes. And that's both as someone who's using it at the back end and someone who would be able to use it at the front end as well, okay. yes. Thank you so much for the work that you do every day, um, and uh, and again to, to this panel, um, totally essential, key component. Thank you so, very much. Thank you so much. Um, does anyone else wish to testify? All right, seeing nobody else at uh, 4:44 p.m., uh, this hearing of the General Welfare Committee is adjourned.